Creek down to the Teton River, down to the Marias or the Missouri, where I did stuff north of the river. Chad focused on stuff between uh, Money Creek and the Missouri, and then south of the Missouri, uh, we shared the area. So this year we got a conflict prevention technician with a $70,000 Safari Club International Foundation grant that we received. And so now we have a full time carcass removal person, which is really nice. And she works across the region. So she goes anywhere there's bears and there's carcasses. So I'll just get into the stats here. And this is the stuff that I focused on uh, for human safety. I did 14 education events this year to over 1,050 people, including Cascade and Haver. We did bear spray training to over 482 people. We gave away over 35 free bear sprays to folks. We installed 12 new bear wear signs, uh, mostly at recreational areas and wildlife management areas where people like to go to increase human safety. Part of that Safari Club International Foundation grant, we have money to build a new uh, bear education trailer, and it's going to be agricultural focused because that's how Region 4 is. All the other bear education trailers in Montana don't really have an ag focus. They're more focused for recreationalists. So this one's focused on grain spills and protecting livestock and human safety. Something I'm really, some shit I'm really excited about, excuse my language, but it's literally shit, is this idea I had to put bear poop into epoxy. We get a lot of calls from folks that say, hey, I got uh, bear poop in my yard. And we go out there and it turns out being deer poop or something. And then also other times we show up at a place and there's 10 bear poops around and folks don't even realize that there's a bear there and they're all full of grain. So I hope uh, to end up with a good collection of shit in the <laughs> next year. Hopefully we don't need a permit for that. <laughs> and we got the fancy uh, charging bear too, radio controlled charging bear. And so this bear education trailer, we're gonna share it with everyone. Chad's gonna use it. Our education folks are gonna use it. Amber's gonna use it. Whoever needs it in the area is going to be able to use it and have all these resources available to them. So part of bear management is just really good communication. When bears were observed in an area or causing problems or we had a colored bear showing up near people, we call people and we tell them, hey, there's a bear around. We give alerts. We did over 590 alerts to people, letting them know that there's bears in the area. Beyond that, we received over 684 phone calls from people related to bears, and that's just to Jack and myself. That doesn't even include all the carcass calls that Aaron did. Of that, I had 49 complaints, 311 calls for information, 146 calls for service, and 104 bear observation calls. And then we have hundreds of in-person contacts. It's just so hard to keep track of. And of course, quick responses is so important. We always respond quickly to folks. So here's our summary for the complaints that we confirmed as being bears in the Conrad area this year. The number one complaint that we had was cattle depredation or bears chasing cattle or attacks on cattle. We had 11 of those. And then that's followed by spilled grain. That's another big conflict where bears are finding uh, unsecured grain. Then we had five instances of bears near dwellings where they weren't even getting into any attractants. We had four complaints of sheep getting killed. We had three encounters, uh, two complaints about beehives, two complaints about chickens getting killed, uh, one complaint about house damage, and one complaint about livestock feed getting into. Here's a map of those complaints from this year. You can see most of the livestock loss happens along the front, particularly along the creeks. And then going further east, we get into more of the grain conflicts and bears near dwellings and that sort of stuff. So the total livestock loss that I helped out with responding to for this year, we had 11 calves killed by bears. We had 22 sheep killed by bears. And the reason why we had four uh, sheep complaints, but 22 kills, 
is because a lot of times when we first get the complaint, we get out there and there's multiple sheep dead. And so that's why it's four complaints, but 22 sheep killed. And same thing with the chickens. We had one night where 27 chickens were killed in a single night, and we had six beehives killed. Uh, one thing that we're running into, uh, which is kind of a challenge, is bears attacking cattle but not killing them. And so that's really hard to respond to because you don't have a target bear to go after. You don't have a carcass to set traps on. And so that was a little bit of a challenge this summer. I think about half of those calves that were killed were attacked first and died weeks later. Part of protecting livestock is we build a lot of electric fences. So we installed five electric fences for livestock this year. Myself and Jack, we removed over 50 dead animals. And then I supervised Aaron, the carcass driver, who removed 462 dead animals. That's more than we've ever removed before. So the program's really growing and I think it's helping out. We had eight complaints of bears getting into grain spills. Some of those issues were really easy to resolve, such as just putting the bags of grain into a garage where it's secure. Other issues is like when you're moving, transporting the grain and the loaders, that's a little more difficult to deal with, but we provide tarps and we also go out and clean to help uh, get bears out of the area. We installed six electric fences around crop products, so things like silage or old bins that are leaking grain that the bears have found. In total, we did we built 20 electric fences plus three guard dog fences to help keep guard dogs near homes. And then we do a lot of fence maintenance. So every week we're going out and checking the fences that we've built, make sure that they're still running properly, that they're not grounded. If the bears are starting to dig under, we run stringers down to keep the, the bears from uh, continuing to dig under. Part of keeping the bears away from people is we also do a lot of scare devices. We deployed over 52 scare devices this year, four propane cannons. We tried a couple of the wavy men that you see in front of the used car dealerships. And I did try one fake rattlesnake this year with the idea that the bears on the prairie should have some experience with rattlesnakes, so you would think that would scare them away. But this bear that I tried it on didn't work. He just knocked it over. Did the wavy man work? It kind of worked. They avoided it and went around it. <laughs> <laughs> Another big part of Aaron's job being the conflict prevention person is securing stored grain better. So all these grain bins, they have really flimsy aluminum doors that even just a person can bend up. So it's nothing for a bear. It's just like a sardine can to a bear. And so she welds steel doors. And so we built and installed 12 steel grain bin doors this year. And we already have evidence of bears trying to get in it, but we're unable to get the stored grain which is a way more serious conflict than a bear just eating spilled grain, because spilled grain is essentially just discarded waste, while stored grain is really where the farmer's money is. And if a bear gets into that, it creates a huge spill, and it's a huge headache. For grain spills, uh, we removed over 26,000 pounds of grain spills this year to help prevent bears from coming near farms or trying to access grain from inside the bins. We even borrowed our uh, maintenance crew's bobcat skid steer this year to help clean up some of these huge grain spills. This summer, we continued with our guard dog research project. We provided four additional guard dogs to three producers. The project's focus, focusing on trying to get bears away from farms that have a lot of grain spills. And so this is the last year of that project. And now we're going to look at analyzing the data with Dr. Julie Young at Utah State University. Here's a heat map. We put trackers on the dogs, and so we'll understand what kind of distribution the, go the dog is uh, guarding. And then we also had collared bears and track surveys and camera traps will help us understand if bear use of these areas with guard dogs is actually reduced. We aggressively hazed 18 bears this year. We used 33 cracker shells and four rubber slugs. 
and we obtained drones now for grizzly bear management. Here's a video. This is a video of the drone in use. This is at a colony where they're getting some grain spills. And there's a uh, family group of bears out here that have been coming in and getting grain spills. These drones are just incredible for their effectiveness in hazing bears. For me to drive across this field and ruin the people's crops is a huge headache for them. And so a lot of times they don't want you to chase the bears because it ruins the crops. And then also having to go through gates and fences, it's just really difficult to chase bears effectively with just vehicles. The bears responded very well to the drones. They 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 flee for from them. <laughs> it's also incredibly safe. And we also use the drones this year to locate injured bears that were bayed up in the brush, which previously was a really dangerous thing for us to do to have to go looking in the brush for injured bears. And now we can do that safely. I also see the drones in the future potentially being useful trying to find uh, lost livestock that might be drug into the brush by bears. And see, a truck would have to stop at this point, and so the hazing event would stop. But the drone, you could just keep going. And you don't have to worry about getting stuck either. Does the drone emit any sound or just um, It sounds like a uh, swarm of bees. Yeah, but you, you're not emitting it. In the future, I'd like to try out some auditory stimulus and also bear spray missiles. <laughs> All right, we can move on, Dylan. This is the range of those bones. That goes uh, three kilometers. So in total, we caught with uh, wildlife services six bears in response to livestock loss. Uh, the first three bears was in April, and essentially a couple calves got killed on the creek. They set traps, nothing showed up within that within the response time frame. But then a week later, a family group showed up on a bone pile nearby. And so we weren't completely sure that was the individuals involved in the depredation, but we just wanted to be proactive. So we went ahead and captured that family group and relocated it to Glacier National Park. Uh, last that we knew of that family group, they were still on the west side. And then later in September, there was some sheep depredations near Conrad. Um, we ended up catching a subadult female on that, but we don't, we're not sure if that was the bear involved. The bear was actually previously collared for the guard dog research and our locations weren't lining up with where the sheep were killed. And there was also several sheep that got killed before we even got a call. And so there's already several bears in the area. So it was hard to sort that one out. Uh, and then later in September, an adult female and a cub uh, killed a, some cattle, and we were able to confirm that. So that bear got euthanized, and this cub was preemptively re relocated to the Jocko. And then we captured seven bears for guard dog research and the grain bin research to help us understand how bears are using agricultural land. And then the nice thing about having those collars out is also allowed us to do a lot of preemptive work. So some of these bears showed up near houses we could then call the people and a lot of times they had no idea that there was bears coming here in the houses and so we were able to go do preemptively uh go out to these folks and keep them safe and get the bears away from their property we had six confirmed grizzly bear mortalities this summer we had one yearling killed by another bear in may infanticide and then we had a subadult male killed in an automobile collision on i-15 we actually had another collision with a bear on I-15, but that bear, we weren't able to find it, and so that was not confirmed. Uh, then we had to euthanize a cub for odd aggressive behavior and it ended up breaking out a window on a house on the Puyer Creek. Uh, in hindsight, I kind of suspect that bear might have had bird flu, 
but I'm not sure. We tested it for rabies and that was negative. And then we euthanized a female for attacking a pickup truck. A farmer was driving down a road uh, and a bear came out of the cattails and started attacking his pickup truck. Uh, and the bear had been previously relocated for a residential conflict and we felt like that aggressive behavior of relocation wouldn't have reasonably resolved that issue. And then we, as I discussed in the previous slide, we uh, euthanized that adult female for cattle depredation. She had been in conflict with livestock before and had already been relocated. And then later in the season, we found an old cub carcass. We couldn't confirm cause of death, but it was likely killed by another bear just based on the scene that we found there. With that, big thank you, everyone at U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, everyone at Fish, Wildlife and Parks, all of our staff, the whole NCDE team, USDA Wildlife Services, they're great. Uh, volunteers, our research tech for the Guard Dog Project, all of the call folks that help us get those alerts out. We really appreciate that work. And then all the people that help fund this work, uh, we really appreciate it. Any questions? In the deal. Question, um, Aaron, I, just as well. I just had a question about your study. Um, are you guys including a social component of that to kind of get what the livestock producers, I know there's only four, but or I think you said four producers, to get kind of what they thought about the study? For the guard dog study? Mm -hmm. we, have, we sure are. We have a two page questionnaire that we're giving to the participants, and we hope to give it to more people. The way we came up with this idea is there's actually producers that are already doing this on their own. Mm -hmm. And they told me, hey, I used to have a lot of bear problems and I got this dog and now I don't have bear problems. So I hope to expand our scope of inference by getting uh, responses from more producers that have dogs. Wesley, um, does everyone have the same kind of dog or what, what's your experience with the types of dogs? The dogs that we put out were all really related. They're Anatolian Shepherd, Boz, or Kangle, which are all kind of in the same clade. And those seem to be very effective. Um, some of the work that Julie, Dr. Young has done has shown that some of the white dog breeds don't seem to be as effective, like Great Pyrenees. They're more of an alerting dog and don't really have the bravery to pursue a bear. But then there's other instances where people have like cattle dogs. Those are good at chasing bears too. So Airedales. Airedales. Yeah. What's the so the study's over for now? Future funding for it? Maybe we'll see. Or what's the? Uh, there's a lot of interest in the project. The people love the dogs. Hmm. The biggest problem we had with the dogs, they loved to roam, and so that's why we had to build some dog fences mm -hmm. to keep the dogs contained. It's not as bad as an electric fence, it's just a single wire. It's a lot easier to maintain. Um, but there's a lot of interest in having more dogs out there. You know, but there's concern with our department for liability and stuff. And that's part of the reason we partnered with USU is to send the money to the university to buy the dogs because yeah. FWP would have buy them. Yeah. Any questions? All right, thank you. So we're going to switch gears. Justin or Eric? Or Justine, come on up. Justine. Sorry, I look quite late. My fault, Justine. I know better. <laughs> it, it happens a lot. <laughs> Yeah. And and just so everyone knows, my name is Justine Valliers. Everyone struggles with my last name. Don't feel bad. It's a common uh, common issue. So um, yeah, so I am uh, the new bear conflict specialist for Region One. Um, even though I'm new as the specialist this year, uh, the past four years I've worked with Tim Manley doing the grizzly bear conflict management. Um, so I'm not new to bear management. Um, however, yeah, there were a lot of new changes this year um, in the region, and um, the first one is uh, we actually, Eric and myself, split the region. Um, I covered the northern part, and Eric covered the southern. So I was covering up to Eureka, um, down to Whitefish, the North Fork, and then up to Marias Pass, and then Eric was covering the South Fork. Um, 
the Kalispell, uh, Valley Bottom, Ferndale, Swan, Maple area. So um, it looked a little different in that we both were covering black bears and grizzly bears this year. Uh, and to say we had a <laughs> very busy season is an understatement. <laughs> um, it was quite busy. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of factors that go into that. Sometimes you just have busy years, but um, I think the slow snow melt off the high country this spring, um, coupled with that, ke that kept bears down in the valley bottom water. And then also, uh, it just wasn't a great uh, berry crop this year. Um, a lot of spotty areas. Um, and so, and then the valley, we just have a lot more people. We have a lot more bears. So we're just seeing an increasing conflicts every year. Um, and then the other change was we now have U.S. Fish Wildlife Services relocating our bears that are caught outside of the recovery zone. So um, overall, I think that went pretty, pretty smoothly, that transition. Um, I think we've all worked really well together um, in continuing those working relationships. So, um, and then, um, so yeah, um, overall, I would say I had a lot more black bear conflicts this year, but uh, I did have 150 grizzly bear conflict calls. Um, 44 of those were more of just sightings, bears in yards, um, passing through properties and such. Um, we had 68 responses, so physically going to the homes or businesses, what have you. Um, and uh, 106 of those conflict calls were bears getting into attractants. So garbage, getting into garbage was probably our the, the major one, and then followed by chicken coops, uh, pet foods, and then uh, outside freezers. That's that was a really <laughs> I've always dealt with that, but this year it seemed to be a really huge issue. Um, so um, of those 46 places that we went. Um, we put that's where we did uh, conflict prevention, put up conflict prevention equipment. So putting up elect loaning out electric fences, motion sensor alarms, um, Kodiak cans, and um, that number doesn't. I couldn't even tell you that number doesn't account for how many electric fences that I fixed um, that were already up, or putting up electric fences for people that were the owners had purchased that equipment themselves. I don't have the numbers for those. Um, but um, this year, I mean, we working with Tim, we always tried to do preventative measures. Um, first and foremost, putting up electric fence to deter bears, oh yeah, cans all securing the attractants. But I really personally tried to hit that hard this year um, and kind of hold people accountable and um, really pushed putting up electric fence to deter animals uh, for the bears uh, before setting traps. Um, I ended up catching 11 grizzlies uh, for were euthanized due to conflict management reasons, um, one of which was a sow with two cubs of the year, um, which uh, those cubs ended up getting sent to a zoo in Pennsylvania. They were caught, they were just too small you know, in the summer to, to make it on their own. So decision was made to to send them to do. Um, and then I had one unmarked male that was hit by a vehicle. So overall, uh, in my area, there wasn't a whole lot of mortalities uh, compared to prior years that I've worked this job. So um, as of right now, I have five collared grizzlies in my northern section. Um, all five are dead right now. I just had my last one go in a few days ago. Um, I have a sow with two yearlings, um, sow with three yearlings, and then a sow with one yearling, and then a single adult female and one adult male, or he might actually be self help from the BIR spring. Um, of the 11 um, that I caught, the U.S. Fish Wildlife Services, so Dory, um, he moved three of mine and I moved two. So not a not a ton there, but I will say Rory's been a great help in putting up electric fence. 
um, this season in years prior, we had time to do a, big, a lot of big electric fence projects, but this year there's just not the time. So Rory has, was a huge help in, in putting up fencing and other communications. Um, and so overall in my area, Eureka and Columbia Falls are two spots that I, I'm seeing the most conflict with grizzlies, um, especially in the fall in Columbia Falls. Um, every year it's always a huge problem area. And, and so this late, late in the fall this year, um, I ended up having three different family groups um, in, in a small little patch, um, and one of which was actually a female with a, um, I don't know, it's a luminary cub of the year, cub of the year, yeah. Um, so she was, she was collared for trend this year. And I mean, she was in and around homes this whole fall. She's still out right now. Um, and I only got one call on her. Uh, so which looking at where she's been, it's pretty shocking. Um, and, you know, it just, you don't know, are people not calling or is this, is she just doing a good job? <laughs> um, I don't know. So, um, yeah, uh, which again, it brings me to my other point that often, more often than not, especially certain areas like Eureka, I know I'm not getting calls. Um, so these numbers that I had said in terms of conflict calls, you know, a lot of give and take because you just don't know how many people are not reporting things. And I you now have people tell me all the time that they're taking matters into their own hands. So, yeah, just just something something to think about. Um, so this season I gave 11 educational talks. Um, did two bear fairs uh, in Polebridge and Whitefish. Um, did pretty pretty good turnout. Um, and then yes, some of the big accomplishments this season for us that Dylan touched upon um, was Whitefish rolling out with all Kodiak cans for the city. Um, I'm really hoping that's gonna you know, help significantly with bear conflicts in the future. Mm -hmm. um, and then also I worked with. Columbia Falls this summer um, to push an emergency 90-day ordinance through for the fall. Uh, I had had a single adult there just for, oh gosh, well over a month, just in town, hitting garbage, tried setting multiple traps, could not catch this bear. I think I have an idea of who it is. Um, it's a bear that I've caught before, has quite a history. Uh, but yeah, I was, you know, thinking about the fall, I was like, this is gonna be, be crazy. But like this spring, summer, we never had a lull, and so I, I worked with the city and really um, pushed the idea home that we we have to start kind of holding ourselves accountable, and taking some steps, um, to be proactive rather than reactive. So um, yeah, they they pushed that ordinance through, and I. I felt like my calls went down significantly in Columbia Falls after that. Um, again, whether or not people just stop reporting, I can't, I'm not totally sure about that, but um, I do know, so there was a person appointed to call um, for violations of this ordinance. So, and the ordinance wasn't just garbage. It was, you need to have chickens, any livestock, have, have electric fence up around that stuff. Um, yeah, garbage needs to be either inside, or in a bear container over a computer. So they covered they covered all of it, which was great. Um, and yeah, I, I kept in close contact with the person that people were reporting these violations to. And he said he was getting a fair number of calls and he then passed it on to the local PD. So they could go and pick it. Um, so yeah, overall, um, that was a, a big big step and so this winter we're going to talk and meet and talk about um, the future going forward is this an ordinance that we can push through to be a more permanent ordinance so yeah overall it was it was a crazy busy season but it, it was a good one um, yeah Any questions just seeing that order what 
What did the community, how did they respond to that? I mean, were they supportive? A lot of people, it's a mix, it's a mixed yeah. bag. You get people that are super supportive, other people are like, yeah, whatever, it's stupid. But um, for the most part, I would say people were like, good, yeah, this needs to happen. I think generally in talking with, with most people I interact with, they're usually in support of, they want bears around, they want to be able to coexist, they want, you know, yeah, they they want the wildlife, and, and they also want people held more accountable. A lot of people ask about laws and why aren't we doing more in terms of not just slap on the hand sort of thing. So, but what was the fine? Um, I don't, I don't know how heavy it was. That's, Probably not much, <laughs> but enough, hopefully, that I, mean, I do know what people were calling it in, and yeah, so. How did they roll in the livestock? Was it just whoever had chickens or two guinea hens and a goat in their backyard, or was it for horses and cattle? Um, I believe it was like more small, like, and in, in, in town, in the small town of Sea Falls, it's it's yeah you're gonna have people just with chickens it's gonna be the small i saw um and i think that's kind of because this yeah the the ordinance was for within the town versus like the outskirts sure yeah yeah i was gonna ask about the outskirts and just what you think what your thoughts are on the likelihood or <clears throat> what the attitudes would be for people that are living outside of the city limit or in, more in the county jurisdiction. Yeah. Yeah. Is that going to be a much harder sell? Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and the big thing that I pushed with within the city was showing them how many grizzlies. I mean, over the past five years that I've been doing this, I mean, it's always we've had like, quite a few grizzlies in town. I mean, in downtown Columbia Falls. And you know, you drive around, it's it's dark. It, a lot of these streets are not lit. <laughs> um, and so I really pushed, you know, at, at some point we're gonna have an issue here. We need to start thinking about how we're gonna go forward. Um yeah, um I I think the outskirts are it's a harder sell. Starting. And then the other thing is there's always been a major that, that area on the, I don't know, I wish I had a map for you guys, because you probably all don't know like Columbia Falls super well, but um, that eastern part, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's <funny. laughs> um, Yeah. Thanks for going. Thank you. <laughs> Alice, can you shower receive? Yeah. Right? Where would you like me to go? <laughs> oh, um, so, oh God. Um, so yeah, just, I mean, the river corridor, essentially um we have a park in there um and then it, it's always been a major corridor for these bears to travel you get you get a lot of natural foods um yeah it's yeah just have... following this whole river and then i mean we're tea kettle mountain and then glacier is just right down there so it's just a natural corridor for that and so the eastern side of Sea Falls is where we see uh, most of this grizz activity and them hitting garbage. So I really push that. If we're, you know, even when I went to the city council, I just said, even if we can just get an ordinance for one side of town and start there, if, you know, we start small, but it was great because they were all about just doing the whole city. So, um, but yeah, this River's Edge Park, there's always a lot of bear activity in there. Um, and then, and then up across the area there, we have a lot of bears that spend a lot of time in here. Um, and yeah, it just made sense to implement a, some sort of strategy to mitigate conflicts because it's every year it gets a little bit worse. So nice job. <laughs> That's awesome. Can I ask one more question? 
Yeah. How, how are the two ordinances handling the, the big round floppy dumpsters that, that they have? The the black 300 gallon yeah, containers. From, from the public. Um, so so in Columbia Falls, um, so I'll start with Whitefish, you have to they pick up your garbage. It's it's oh. um they were get they got rid of all of those to pick fish. Did we go to 90s? So 90s? yeah, everyone's getting a 90. For households. For households, yes. We still have the group. Yes. Nine. For we, big ones, uh, in the for businesses. For my businesses like downtown. It's still a huge problem. And they're trying to help. Baby steps. But there's no <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um for households. They're gone, but yeah, this is it's still a thing. So yeah, process. Um, and then Columbia Falls. Um, not everyone, if you don't want to have your garbage picked up, you don't have to. A lot of people go to the green box site. And so um those people have their own container. But all of the green box sites are electric fence. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions for Christine? <laughs> so I'm Eric Wenham, uh, and I'm going to kind of pick up on a couple of things that Justine was talking about and then uh, finish out a couple of questions. So Cecily asked in terms of the county. Uh, so <laughs> I have a long and glorious history with whitefish. Uh, for a little over 20 years, Jim Williams is involved, Lee Anderson has been involved, and a whole host of people have been involved uh, trying to get whitefish to be sort of the shining beacon of western, you know, northwest Montana, the West Yellowstone, bear proof the entire community. We can do this. You have money. You're an affluent, an affluent community. We can make this happen. And for years and years and years, we continually got pushback. Even at the same time, we're darting you know, grizzly bears on City Beach repeatedly. Um, we're having bears, you know, grizzly bears in downtown, literally downtown, whitefish on a regular basis. And the city council just was, they were adamantly, vehemently opposed to doing anything. And they were afraid of cost. They were afraid of pushback from the taxpayers. Um, you know, they had a lot of fears. However, they never had fear of a liability lawsuit coming out of these bears that are living in whitefish. And when I say living in whitefish, I mean, we have family groups of black bears that are reared, they're born, reared, live, rear their own, and die all within the city of limits of whitefish, always. They never leave town. So after probably 12 or 15 years of battling with city council, who were not receptive to the idea at all, I changed the game and started talking to the city attorney and started talking about liability and Idaho lawsuits for millions of dollars and those sorts of things started to make a little progress. But to Cecily's question, what really made the progress was a change of the city council. So if you have the right personnel or the right people on some of these boards or uh, elected officials, city councils, those sorts of things, things can start to change. And about five years ago, it seemed like we were starting to make a little bit of headway. And it was simply because there had been a change on, on the council. Um, when Andy Fury was the mayor of uh, Whitefish, one of the reasons he wouldn't sign the ordinance that we had, that we had developed, was because he wouldn't be in, he would be in violation of his own ordinance as the mayor of Whitefish. <laughs> and Tim Manley and I said, well, hell, we'll build you a shed so you have some place to store your garbage. And he, it took three years to get him to sign. So those are the sort of things that we talked about. Northwest Montana, those are the snags we run into. But to put it in perspective, we have 100,000 people in Flathead Valley right now. Um, the Census Bureau is still trying to compile their numbers to look at our growth from this last year, from, uh, from I think it's April of 21 through uh, January of 22, or December of 22. I don't have those numbers yet, so I talked to the DMV based on loosely based on what they're putting together from state registration changes, accounting for two people per vehicle, the flathead grew at about 17% since April of this year. And 
it's crazy. I mean, when we're talking about 100,000 people stacked on top of, you know, a black bear per square mile, stacked on top of grizzly bears, stacked on top of everything else that we've got going on. There's a lot happening in the flathead. And so when we have these minor, you look, you think about it, it's, you know, I did the turkey trot and whitefish um, on Thursday. It's a small race. And the route that we take kind of navigates and circles around through whitefish. And it was uh, beyond imaginable when I'm driving or jogging along and I see all of these Kodiak cans that are starting to get laid out through town. And I was like, it took me 20 years, but I'm actually driving by, jogging by one. And it might work. So I'm very excited about next year to see the one snag. And Dylan and I, we've talked about it, putting together a little video, putting it on the city council's web page, putting on our own web page about how to operate. Them. Yeah. <laughs> because there were people who were jogging along with me who had stuff, you know, getting rid of whatever they're getting rid of. And I saw a couple who were keeping the same pace as I was stop at three different garbage cans and try to figure out how to make them work. So we still have work to be done on that front, but I digress. So, but it is kind of gratifying and it is a change of people. So when Dave Prunty took over the county, we were able to get suddenly all the green box sites. You know, Dave Prunty had worked for the county for a long time, but he was he was one of the site managers. As soon as he actually became one of the solid, uh, solid waste manager guys, we started having conversations, and now all the green box sites are electrified. They're manned, and they're at the hours, you know, closure hour. So with the right people in place, things can happen. So it's kind of gratifying to see what's going on. Um, so just to put it in perspective, I'll give you some numbers real quick. And since I'm going to tell you that, well, I'm just going to jump ahead for a little bit. So we have 100,000 people in the valley. 87% of my radio, my management radio callers are still out and active. That's females with cubs. That's adult males. That's everybody under the sun. And they're still out active. I have no explanation why. Lori makes fun of me that her bears are all going to bed. Just, you know, just told us that her bears are going to bed. And one of my bears have actually gone to bed. <laughs> so these are preliminary numbers because I expect that my season is not over quite yet. Uh, so, 293 calls about bears that are in conflict of some sort. You know, ours again. We don't have the track uh, or the grain bins. We have a few kind of issue here and there. We don't have the livestock. You talked about livestock. And I'll go down another rabbit hole just on that note. Uh, our biggest problem is we have hobby farms, and that's three chickens, a duck, and a goat. <laughs> And I can go to Murdoch's and buy a new batch of chickens for $3 a piece. So what do I do? I put no capital expense into securing my $3 chicken. That's the number one. Jamie Jonkel, wherever he is, several years ago, coined chicken with the new trash. And he was spot on. Trash is a huge problem, of course. Chickens are probably our number one. I got it. It was chickens. <laughs> Like my God, uh, but chickens are definitely at, right up there as a very close second in terms of where our problems are, and that's because of Bobby Farm and the county, uh, the the city ordinance. Uh, the county doesn't have the problems. Um, so those two hundred ninety three calls, I responded to seventy eight. Uh, resulting in 18 management captures. And of those 78, that includes everything from just walking on their property to saying, hey, you should get that secured, that's a problem, and electrifying that to setting a culvert trap, all the INE, you know, information education, the key campaigns that we can throw at people, all the insurers, all the stuff that we've got. Uh, you know, it's always kind of that constant INE battle going through with, this, with the publics. Um, of the 18 management captures, four, only four, which actually kind of surprised me this year, considering how many bears we had on the landscape uh, getting into things. Um, only four had previous management histories in my area. So on South Highway 3, all the swan and all that. Um, so it resulted in 14 new bears, which 
a couple of theories, operating theories. One, we have more bears on the landscape, but a lot of these were middle age or you know certainly adult class bears, so they're not new bears on the landscape. Um, I think because we had a pretty widespread food failure, huckleberries were a complete bust across the ecosystem or across our part of the world. Um, and so I think we're seeing a lot of interior bears coming out. And I don't know that for fact because the ones that are radio collared haven't left to go home yet because they have left. They have left. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see when they start to den and if uh, when we actually have good food production year, uh, if they stay at home. Yes. I was going to ask if that, do you think that's due to they're still out because they didn't build up enough fat storage or do we have any? You, you know, I'm just curious. It's a great question. Don't well, I can tell you that everybody that we have handled collectively, myself or Justine, even the, the trend uh, bears, they're all in great shape. Yeah. Okay. They are. They're all super fat. Uh, it's they're not food strutting, you know, looking at them when we have them in hand. Uh, I mean, they're all really great shape. So from a body condition, you know, a body index condition side of things, I don't think that's what's driving okay. them. Bears are smart. They know where those foods are. You know, we don't give them enough credit. You know, we think that they're totally relying on the berries, um, but we know that that can't possibly be the case, but we don't give them enough credit. They're crafty at finding those other things without necessarily creating management problems. But there's always those few or 18 that do wind up getting in management issues. Um, so, and again, uh, we talked about relocations, the, the big change with the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, so of those of those 18 bears, 16 were relocated. Um, I did seven of those, and then Rory and et al. Um, did uh, six uh, relocations for me for a total of nine bears. So a couple of family groups got thrown in. Uh, that was seven mortalities. One was a management removal. Uh, one was removed for health reasons, and we kind of had Wesley alluded to it. Chad had a bear. Uh, I had a, had a cub of the year grizzly bear that I'm not sure. We sent it off for rabies. We sent it off, hopefully, for encephalitis, but because of the rabies test, they got rid of the brain when they had it uh, after the rabies test, so we're not going to get the encephalitis uh, results back. I suspect that's probably what it was. Um, you know, after 37 x-rays and extensive vet examination on this bear, it's not trauma, it's not impact trauma, it's nothing wrong. We did blood gas and chemistry on it. Uh, everything was fine. The only thing that might be wrong is a brain-related issue, and there's only two things that are left. One is encephalitis, it's a congenital brain defect, and we don't have the brain anymore. So I don't know. Um, we had three automobile strikes. Uh, we had one that I kind of labeled malicious. Um, and then I had one confirmed but highly probable home defense. Uh, and that's a bear that was shot at point blank range of 2570 through the kitchen window, somewhere in the upper chest. It led like crazy, then we couldn't recover anything. So I don't know. Uh, I mean, we, we don't know sex yet. We've got DNA results back. But uh, I suspect it's going, it's likely a sub adult male based on everything that was at the site. But I have no covers. No, okay. Uh, so, status of radio collar bears, like I said, 87% of my bears are still out. That includes adult males, adult females with cubs, and adult female with three cubs. Um, and then I do have one cub of the year that's wearing a VHF ear tag transmitter um, that we're kind of experimenting with to see what she'll do. Uh, I just put that out uh, about what five, six days ago, and so I haven't had a chance to fly or whether it's been kind of cruddy. We released it in Swan uh, for easier monitoring from the ground, uh, but then I haven't been able to get into the air to, to actually do anything with it yet. Um, tracks and remote cameras and reports from the public indicate that I have numerous bears that are still uh, unradioed bears that are still out and about. Um, and so, like I said, my numbers are pretty preliminary. I don't think uh, I, I'm hoping. Uh, but I thought that when we were at negative one degrees, that I thought maybe that was bears were going to make a final push. Uh, I had a couple of bears go up slope and they all come back down. Apparently, they, I think it what it is. Lori says it. Well, Lori has her own theories. I think it's just they don't want 
they, they miss me too much. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so with that, I think, you know, I, I'll just that's kind of summarize real quickly everything that's been going on. And I'm hoping that maybe things will actually start to get better for me. So with that, I'll take a few questions. So good I am, right? <laughs> okay, switching gears to uh, region two. Well, we all took a couple weeks off for hunting, so uh, we didn't get everything tabbed up. Um, that's work in progress right now. But we deserve a little time off. It was a hellish year with black bears for us. Um, let's see, uh, Jamie Jonkel, part of the Region 2 Bear Management Team. Um, we've got a pretty big crew uh, on the south end anymore, which has been nice. We're getting uh, a lot done. Uh, Eli Hampson uh, is not here today. He's uh, in Australia, we think. He was <laughs> back uh, Saturday, but we haven't seen him yet. <laughs> but... Um, these guys would hold up your hands. So uh, we got Bruce Montgomery. Uh, Bruce was recently hired this spring to take on the Bitterroot Valley, but uh, we all work the whole region too. So it's kind of nice. We, uh, we're all available to assist wherever is needed. And then um, this midsummer, we uh, picked up Brad Ballas. Uh, Brad's got the Deer Lodge. Uh, Flint uh, Valley country down there by Georgetown Lake, Anaconda, but also is uh, helping Region 3 over in the big hole, the purple areas of Region 3. <clears throat> and um, then we have uh, Eric Graham as well. Eric uh, is kind of uh, working with the department through the Blackfoot Challenge. And we had a really nice working relationship with the Blackfoot Challenge for, for many, many years. And, and Eric, uh, spends most of his time just in the black book doing preemptive stuff and then uh, doing management. Um, we work closely with our game wardens here in Region 2, which is nice because there's a huge, you know, workforce there. And so when we need assistance, I mean, we got wardens scattered all over and they're all going to help us. And they do quite a bit of the black bear stuff. We work real close with wildlife services. Uh, Craig Glazier, <laughs> uh, Ted North, Bart Smith, and then John Mitke. They're all in the Region 2 area. Um, two people I'd like to acknowledge are the folks that pick up our carcasses. Uh, we've got Barry Gordon, who is employed through the Blackfoot Challenge, and then we have Dan Massey, who's also employed through the Blackfoot Challenge. We've got a really good carcass pickup program in the Blackfoot and a good portion of the Deer Lodge Valley. Um, we're expanding that now. We don't know if it's smart, but uh, we just started doing the Bitterroot Valley. Uh, so uh, that's picked up a lot of interest, and I have a feeling we're probably going to be able to find someone to help us out there. And then in the Deer Lodge Valley, we're expanding it. And we just got a new trailer uh, with a dump bed uh, that should be arriving soon. And then we've got a couple other trailers that we're rigging up with winches and stuff. So our carcass pickup program has expanded uh, a great deal. Um, what's nice, we have a lot of support here in Region 2. For example, we have uh, <clears throat> the uh, Wind River Bear Institute. They're based down in the uh, Bitterroot. Uh, they're the ones with the Carillion Bear Dogs. So we have a really good partnership with them whenever we need bear dogs right there help us out um let's see we work closely with uh the nrcs uh defenders of wildlife uh the wildlife services fencing program um and we just do a ton of fences all sizes big ass fences medium sized fences little fences uh we put out a lot of fences and uh eric did give me a list but I won't name them off. They're, they're too long, too thick forever to talk about all the fences that uh, we put in this year. Um, let's see, we also work uh, with people in carnivores. 
Lisa Upson and then Kim Johnson's really helpful in that high divide country. Um, Great Bear Foundation, boy, uh, they do all of our apple bleeding. Uh, they pick a ton of apples. And a lot of those apples, you don't know, go to the uh, cider house and uh, some cool stuff there. They also assist us with uh, a lot of the pie and e efforts. Um, we also have uh, a group here in Missoula that started a GoFundMe site uh, and then uh, actually uh, worked with a cider company to, or no, the, uh, a local brewery to make a beer that uh, was pretty good, an apple beer. Uh, that GoFundMe site is allowing us to pick sites just here in the Missoula area where we have a lot of conflicts with those round tubs. And pretty much the only thing you can do with a round tub or, you know, if, or if there's just a gob of little tiny uh, rollouts that are non bear resistant is a containment shed. It can either be electric or metal and, and just completely contained. So uh, with that GoFundMe site, we're, we're building a lot of those containment uh, structures. Um, let's see, Chuck Bartabaugh, uh, Be Bear Wear Program <laughs> has his bear trailer. He's out there all summer, parked somewhere, working in some little community somewhere, helping us with all of our talks and presentations. He's he's always there with his Be Bear Wear trailer. Um, big thanks to Blackfoot Challenge and, and the Partners Program who do all that work in the Blackfoot. Uh, I mean, the Blackfoot's coming together nicely. I mean, we've we've done a lot of stuff in that valley and, and been very progressive. And it's uh because of those two NGO efforts. Um, <laughs> and then just a big thanks to all the communities, private citizens, neighborhoods, NGOs, uh, agency staff that we work with. I mean, we we just, we couldn't do it with all, but we got a lot of help here in Region 2. We just like to acknowledge that. Um, like I said, black bears were nuts this year. We did have a food failure of uh, some sort, you know, we can kind of uh, take stabs at why we had a food failure, environmental changes, climate change, all that kind of stuff. But all we know is that we were busy from May on, just constant black bear stuff. Uh, and it's still going on. In fact, uh, we got a bear working uh, the Edgewater here, Burger King and Pizza Cut, uh, just, you know, across the block here. Uh, Piltsville, Bonner, still have a ton of black bears <laughs> working the rattlesnake. Um, Bitter a few bears. Uh, grizzlies, still very active. Um, we don't have a lot of colored bears, uh, but the two little ones, uh, are they den yet from the Bitter? Or are they? Yeah. yeah. They are den. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but we've got a lot of grizzly activity still up in the Blackfoot. And of course, I'm getting a lot of phone calls from the trappers. You know, everyone wants to, because November had that snow, you know, they're like, oh, we can start trapping now. So a lot of these guys are really pushing for uh, an opening before January. And uh, I'm having to tell these guys that, man, we still got a lot of grizzlies out. Family groups, lone bears, all through the Black Um, It was fairly quiet with the grizzlies. You know, we had plenty of conflicts, but the food failure didn't seem to impact our grizzlies down here like it did black bears. Um, you know, I think they're just a little bit more adaptable if you can, you know, find some other food sources. Um, let's see. So, like I said, I haven't had a chance to really go through the data yet and figure out all of our conflicts. Um, and you know, just like Eric, we could have a, a calf kill tomorrow or a uh, grain shed hit tomorrow. So it's not over till the fat lady sings. Um, usually most of our bears are totally dead by just before Christmas every year. Um, you know, there's always one or two lurking out, you know, even sometimes in, in January. Um, it seems like in the spring, it's usually... March 3rd, March 8th is when our first big males come out. Um, 
So this year we had six mortalities. Uh, we had a cub of the year uh, killed uh, midsummer by a vehicle on Highway 200 near the uh, North Fork of the Blackfoot River. Um, this was actually a cub of a female that was really getting into a lot of conflict. She was hitting brain sheds, barns, uh, the whole nine yards, and she was dragging these cubs back and forth across Highway 200. And that little cup did get smoked. Uh, later in the summer, we did have to remove that female and the cub. Uh, they just progressively got worse and worse and worse. <laughs> so we did remove them. It was interesting, a lot of people in the valley started being critical of themselves in the back of the challenge as a result of the removal of that female, you know, thinking they had failed. And uh, I had to have several pep talks with people. I was like, you know, look, even uh, up in, uh, you know, these areas in Canada where they have everything running smoothly, they still every year have individual bears that are going to conform to all the rules that we have and we'll get into trouble. And this female was a good example of that. So uh, I don't know if my pep talk worked, <laughs> but uh, even if you are doing everything right, doesn't mean the bears are. So you're always going to get the occasional bear that will rebel and cause trouble and have to be removed. Um, let's see, Wildlife Services removed uh, a young grizzly in Lincoln. They killed a bunch of sheep. Uh, we weren't really too involved with that. Um, this spring, we captured two little grizzlies just outside of Missoula, uh, up the Blackfoot on Highway 200 at Twin Creek. Um, it was kind of interesting uh, trying to put the story together, but the one was missing a foot. And uh, then about a day later, after we were handling them, they found a foot up in Snowball. And uh, we think this is the family that was in the South Hills last year that I talked about. We don't really know what happened, but I'm highly suspect that, you know, maybe mom got shot, the other sibling got shot, and the two, you know, ended up over in Twin Creek. But they actually crossed through the rattlesnake. We had tracks in the fresh snow this spring, right, right through the middle of the residential area <laughs> in the lower rattlesnake. Uh, very exciting uh, for me to uh, finally have grizzlies here in Missoula. Um, not that I want that to occur, but <laughs> it, it's happening. Um, so we ended up having to put down that little bear, really bad infection. It had gone septic, it's ugly. Um, the sibling was a female, slapped a collar on her, and she was trying to eke out a living, but uh, she started digging up pocket gophers that had been poisoned. And she ate enough pocket gophers and brown squirrels where, where she died from strychnine. Um, let's see. Yeah, that uh, pretty much covers that. You know, we had a few road possible road kills, additional road kills that when we did respond, you know, we could never find anything, but people just swore up and down, you know, there's a dead grizzly land right there. And by the time we got there, we couldn't find it. Uh, let's see, uh, research trapping. You know, usually we could find a couple of weeks to do some research trapping. We just, it was too busy this year. And we're hoping next year we, we can do some. But uh, did get some baits out up in Gold Creek, just outside of Missoula again, and uh, got photographs of three big adult males there. Uh, so any more, like I always used to tell people, the grizzly zone is up 200 until you get to about Clearwater Junction, and then once you get past the big cow statue, you know you're going to be a grizzly country. Last year I was saying Potomac. This year I'm saying. Bonner. We had a lot of grizzly activity, a lot of verified grizzly activity in and around Bonner and upstream from Bonner. So, you know, the, the zone is here. It's in Missoula. Um, grizzly bear management, uh, 
One uh, big male, old research bear, was captured by wildlife services. We called him lucky, or we called him lucky four. Uh, he killed a calf uh, out of Lincoln, and uh, he got a another chance. Got relocated to the South Fork of Flathead. We had a handful, or wildlife services dealt with a handful of uh, calf depredations in and around that Orlando and Hillville country, but but no other captures. But I haven't tabbed the total up yet. We usually average about eight depredations a year in the Blackfoot. Um, and then of course there's that female that was raising heck uh, that we had to put down with the cub. She was responsible for the bulk of our conflicts. Uh, I'd say 20 of our conflicts were her. But we did have a, a male grizzly. We think it was a, a good adult male working Potomac pretty hard, hitting the dumpsters, hitting the garbage cans. And at one point, uh, we believe he went over on the Clark Fork face and was working Kramer Creek and Donovan and Kendall for a little bit, came back, and uh, he's introduced us to a lot of people in Potomac. <laughs> and we now have a working group in Potomac, two working groups actually. And making some headway, got some very resistant uh, lids in place, and just yeah, you know, we got people that are concerned now <laughs> and willing to work with us. Um, we had a, a sadly, it was a female that we had collared uh, a while back. Uh, had a ear transmitter uh, in the Woodworth area. Um, she showed up, and she was uh, getting into chicken coops and grain sheds. She was responsible for about four or five of our conflicts. Uh, hopefully she'll straighten up. But what was nice is uh, Eric uh, and others were able to just follow her and get electric fence up. Wherever she hit, you put up temporary electric fence. And uh, it's nice now the community is very interested in doing permanent electric fence. Slates. Uh, then we have a, another family group, a female that was also, I think, Causing some trouble last year in that Ovando Hillville area. A grain, grain sheds, Crystal Lick, uh, the uh, creek feeders. Um, so she got into trouble four or five times in the in the Hillville area. She also likes apples. Uh, but really, it was pretty darn quiet with grizzlies compared to other years. And amazingly, Seely Lake was totally. You know, Sealy Lake can be a war zone. It was quiet with black bears and quiet with, with grizzlies. And we just had a patchwork, a berry crop. You know, some places hucks were good. Some places hawthorn was good. Some places choke, choke cherry were good. But it wasn't, the thing we didn't have this year was that massive hawthorn choke cherry crop, you know, that was everywhere and abundant. Um, so it's a little unusual here. Uh, we continue to do, you know, tons of prevention, work with uh, lots of NGOs, have lots of partnerships. Um, like I mentioned, those containment uh, structures around garbage sites are, are one big thing. We push, uh, you know, rollouts, bear resistant rollouts. I got a lifespan in three or four years, if you're me. You know, we push these metal dumpsters, these metal lids, you buy them, you think it's sold, Chris, they don't work in three years. But these containment structures last for a long ass time. So that's that's where we're going, you know, uh, get it contained and in behind a good structure that a bear can't break into. But it's simple for a person to use. Uh, like I said, big fence projects up in the Blackfoot working with NRCS. Um, you know, multiple uh, other projects uh, with uh, defenders. Um, the Bear Smart program in Missoula is rolling along real, real nice. Um, you know, it's been so crazy with black bears for about the last three or four years. You know, and people start crabbing at me and crabbing at uh, the rest of us, and we're just like, oh. And it, I think it really worked. You know, we were just like, well, the thing you got to do is call your commissioner. 
And pretty soon the commissioners were like calling us, asking us to come in, present, and and same with the council, same with the mayor. Uh, and that's how that sort of came together. Uh, we asked if we could do a, a hazard or no, we asked. What they did, we had a previous group called the Missoula Bear Buffer Zone Group. And after the county approached us and the city approached us, they said, take this group and turn it into this new Missoula Bear Smart Group. And so then we got a whole bunch of raft of people that was working with. We got the hazard assessment already done for Missoula. We got a management plan done for Missoula. We we're mimicking the program in Canada. And uh, they accepted it all, said, go for it, go forth. And uh, now we're getting ready to kind of like start making the ordinances and doing all the changes. So now the tough, tough work begins. Uh, what's nice is Sealy. Finally, we've tried a thousand different approaches in Sealy and they've never worked. But um, I went to one of the community council meetings and I used the Ovando incident from last year. And I said, that bear probably got started up here, <laughs> you know. And um, I basically said, you know, of all the communities in the NCD, maybe next to Columbia Falls, that Sealy Lake is the worst. And it seemed to have an impact on them. And, all of a sudden, they wanted to start doing something too. So, this uh, winter we're going to do a, a hazard assessment and and mimic what we're doing in Missoula, but not so much county involved. A little, little different twist. Same thing with uh, Alberton. You know, Alberton's nothing but a, a town with an orchard, and you know the entire town's an orchard. And so they got just inundated with bears this year. And so that community wants to do a hazard assessment. Go very smart as well. Um, got all sorts of really good programs going on in, in the bitter. Did I talk about it? The bitter ecosystem. So many meeting. I we won't go into that. But uh, Brad is just doing a ton of stuff up in the Deer Lodge Valley, and we're rolling along up there. Uh, Southern Grizzlies. Uh, I always give you a little update. Like I said, around Missoula, we're starting to see a lot of grizzly activity. Miller Creek, just outside of town, Lolo. Uh, so it's starting. And then we had these two little grizzlies that Bruce caught that showed up down in the Bitterroot Valley. Uh, after we collared them, we are hoping they'd stay there, but of course they both, you know, pulled out. But, and are you going to show a little? Um, I, I do have a little animation of what they did i can okay. I, I can show it a little later i okay. don't have it here but that'll be cool um that's pretty much it uh you're gonna have to wait for your hair samples what yeah i'll get them to you <laughs> next week we haven't even <laughs> oh yeah lacquers <laughs> but uh that's it questions for jamie no one do <laughs> did you notice uh the similar things that Bear, uh, Eric noticed with the condition on those bears, even with the, not the greatest of uh, food source years, their body conditions were still pretty good. You know, we just uh, handled uh, uh, a few. Of course, those two little ones in Twin Creek were nothing but skin and bones, uh, barely hanging on. Um, but all the others, yeah, they, they were doing just forky. I think, you know, when the berries are crapo, they do, they find other food sources. And sadly, you know, some years it's like human food sources. Uh, just anecdotally, like we have a, a, just a ton of black bears in town. And normally the bears we have in town, you know, are the spindly little, you know, punker looking two-year-olds, you know, that have that weird dorsal strip and big ears and the females with young or the cubs or the cubs this year, Big males in town. I don't know if you guys saw that up in Region One, but I mean, just at Bernice's Bakery, we caught five. I mean, huge adult males. Uh, so this year, the shift we saw was big males coming into town for the best food and hogging the best food, <laughs> making the little yearlings and two-year-olds kind of work the edges of town. The plug for Bernice's. So. Yeah. <laughs> plug for Bernice's. Yeah. Yeah. Cakes and yeah.
Well, I got a question. So we're seeing obviously a lot of black bears you're saying coming into the town. When we have that, do we see kind of that next year them kind of doing the same thing because it's now a learned aspect? Or what if we yeah we have any kind of yeah sadly when they start doing that goes in the memory map yeah and it seems like the next year they're right on it again yeah okay. uh but after a time i think i even found out that with looking at some of these female grizzlies that come into town and are raised in town they can you know shift and go back to a wild food base for many years but then when you have a food failure you're back okay, right back any other questions Jamie. Okay, we got uh, Chad. Is Chad. Chad's going to be on for areas. Thank you, sir. Blackfeet. Or uh, he's still at WP Region Four. And then uh, Jeff. Chad. Chad. I'm Chad Wayne. I'm a bear specialist out of Shoto. I queued this up. What's that? Do you want me to queue up that? Yeah, please. Uh, Daniel's actually going to try to do it online, so maybe don't do this. He might, he might okay. skip the share. So our technician out of Shoto, Daniel McHugh, put together, uh, reported all of our conflict information this year and put together his own slideshow. So he's going to present for us this year. And uh, I've been really impressed with Daniel. I think he's just doing a great job. And I'd like to see how he does for all of us. But I'll be around to answer any questions. But uh, Daniel's going to try to, to screen share. He's home right now. He's actually moving, has a new baby. He's sicker than he's been in years, and he's doing this. Oh, no. He's biting off a lot, so we'll see see how it goes. But I think it'll do really well. Yeah. Hey, can everybody see me there? Yes. Yeah. Hey, yeah, I'm, I'm like, uh, as Chad alluded to, I'm a little sick. So excuse any coughs you might hear. Uh, I'm going to give this screen share a go. Not as familiar with Teams. Is that working? Give it a sec. Third. Can you see yep. your presentation there? Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. So, uh, 2020. You can go into uh, presentation mode, maybe, or, or maximize that. There you go. Perfect. You can see it now? Yep, perfect. All right, got to love technology. OK, so uh, this is uh, the presentation for the southern end of Region 4's uh, uh, bear management team. Uh, that's Chad White, bear specialist who you just saw, and, and myself, Daniel McHugh, I'm the technician. Um, so we, as Wesley kind of talked about, our, our zone is split. Um, or our, our region split between two zones. We do everything south of the Mud, Muddy Creek um, all the way to the region three line. And then the Conrad team uh, handles everything north of Muddy Creek all the way to the uh, Canadian border. Um, we kind of split everything east of Interstate 15 and we work pretty closely with uh, the Conrad team to make sure that we're hitting everything as quickly and efficiently as we can. Um, so just basic management tools we employ are prevention, education, and obviously conflict response. Uh, hopefully if you do really well on prevention and education, you don't have to do as much response. Um, in terms of prevention, uh, you know, kind of like Jamie talked about, we uh, we also hunt. <laughs> so we've, we've been trying to throw everything together as quickly as we can recently, but kind of the preliminary numbers I've got here is we used a ton of cracker shells, screamers, paintballs, and occasionally some rubber bullets. And then my bear dog, you can see covered in mud and left there uh, to haze well over 20 bears. Um, we had a kind of a strange year where we had a lot of sows with with yearling uh, or with the cub of the year triplets. So our number might be a little bit inflated there, but a lot of hazing, a lot of aversive conditioning. Uh, we erected well over 20 electric fences, bats uh, and dumpsters. Um, between, you know, uh, I would I would say that number is probably closer to 30, maybe even 40 if you count just temporary electric fences, but permanent fixtures around 20. And then uh, we gave out one bear resistant trash can, placed six permanent bear wear signs at various locations. Uh, many of those were on uh, recreation areas, uh, wildlife management areas and such. And then uh, we worked closely with uh, 
FJP Region 4 staff to add permanent bear wear signs to block management areas with uh, high bear use. Uh, this is this is an area we're really working to develop. We've been working with uh, with uh, Amber Cornack on this a lot too with US Fish and Wildlife Service, but just trying to develop a, a more cohesive way to uh, you know get signage out on some of these uh, block management areas where there are a lot of bears. Uh, we don't want to um, conflate the messaging uh, for block management areas where there's not a lot of bears. But we also want people that are coming from out of state to be aware that uh, when they're looking in the brush at what they think is porcupine, it might actually be a grizzly bear. So we want to be sure that people know what the, what they're dealing with when they're out there hunting in the field, and then they can take the necessary precautions. And then uh, we picked thousands of apples, and I removed every single ap apple tree I possibly could. But uh, landowners don't usually want to do that. So a lot of electrifying apple trees, picking apples, and, and stuff like that. Uh, Wesley talked about this, so I'm not going to go way too uh, into detail about it, but uh, he hired Aaron Fanger to uh, do the uh, Region 4 carcass pickup program. And uh, we, Chad and I, helped her uh, remove many, many carcasses, and then she removed hundreds out of our area just by herself. So big thanks to Aaron for, for doing a great job on that. Um, we gave on my account, 11 educational talks to somewhere around 250 individuals, ranging from community wide education events, schools, US Forest Service, and, and colleges. Uh, we gave over 10 bear spray uh, educations and nearly 100 bear sprays out. Um, and we, we try to, you know, patrol a little bit during hunting season and get people, uh, you know, talk to people about what they're using for protection. Hopefully, next year we can be a little bit better about this, but. Patrol, um, talk to people about what they're using for protection, try to um, get them bear spray, get them a little bit of a bear spray education so um, they know how to use it uh, if, if they do take one. Um, just in case any of you guys don't know, uh, by my estimation, anecdotally, probably about 75% of people, you put a can of bear spray in their hand, kid or adult, they won't know how to use it. Um, it's really important to make sure that you're following that up with giving them an inert can and showing them how to actually deploy bear spray safely. Uh, that's something that, again, I see on a regular basis. I've had people say, uh, grown men say, oh, yeah, no big deal. And I say, OK, go ahead and give it a spray and tell me what you think and watch them fiddle around with the uh, safety for about five minutes before they hand it over to me and say, all right, show me how to do it. So. Um, conflict, complaint and response. So this is kind of a hard thing to analyze. Um, we get so many calls for bear sightings. We don't have a lot of trees out here, so a lot of people see bears. A lot of people call us uh, about sightings, but um, you know we don't we don't respond to every single time somebody calls about seeing a bear. Uh, we responded to about 110 bear calls in 2022. Uh, many of those were related to black bears, or were preemptive site visits in response to sightings. Um, you know, I feel a little bit. Uh, like this is only about a quarter. This presentation only covers about a quarter of what we did this year because we had so many black bear conflicts that we had to respond to. Um, I think a, a good portion of our year was taken up by that. So, um, you know, these numbers are a little bit uh, deflated, if anything. But um, so of those 110 bear calls that we responded to, 37 of those were confirmed grizzly bear conflicts slash complaints. And uh, we say conflict slash complaints because anytime a bear walks up and and eats open grain, we don't necessarily consider that a conflict, um, but it is definitely something worth responding to. So uh, if a bear, so we define that as a bear obtaining unnatural food, killing livestock, causing property damage, spending excessive time near an occupied dwelling or people, or having an encounter with a human requiring agency response. Then of course there's nuances to, to all of those things. Uh, we fielded hundreds of calls about bear sightings, like I said, and then uh, a lot of uh, many of those. I don't have an exact number in Chad May if you guys have a question about this, but many of those were east of Great Falls um, all the way out towards Lewistown. Um, and then uh, Chad spent a considerable amount of time out there doing education events and, and uh, working with members of the public to to help out with prevention and stuff. And, we res and he also responded to several potential grizzly bear complaints and concerns. This is kind of how our conflicts break down. Um, as you can see, you know, uh, many of these are proximity to people and home and, uh, you know, that can be really scary for folks. So we try to really be on top of that and make sure that. Uh, uh, you know, 
we're keeping everybody safe and, and that nothing bad happens on our watch. Uh, so we're really responsive to proximity to home conflicts. And a, a lot of that, you know, it may just be someone had a, a cow die and they brought it up by their house for whatever reason and a bear found it and they're just not used to bears having been there um and so it's kind of a just as people are shifting and learning about living alongside grizzly bears on the rocky mountain front and and out on the prairie they're they're figuring out that they can't practice things the same way and we uh, have a lot of grace and try to really be helpful with people like that um depredation of that 15 number is actually a bit inflated uh Last year we had, I think, 16 events, and this is 15 events, but um, one bear in Augusta was uh, uh, credited for about four of those, I believe. And then uh, we also added chickens to the depredations number, so a little bit, little bit inflated. And then every, everything else was pretty low. You know, we did have some human interactions this year. Um, how we no human interactions is also complicated because people you know run into there's a decent amount of grizzly bears on the river bottoms out here people run into them frequently i do when i'm recreating uh we don't know every time someone encounter or sees a grizzly bear but if it's an encounter that's worthy of us showing up and, and trying to respond and make sure that uh, everything's okay then we, we know that so depredations by type um, these aren't the numbers of animals well i guess the cattle are but uh, we had these are the numbers of depredations so you, uh, we had five poultry events one sheep event and then and it actually was only one uh one sheep and uh eight cattle and many chickens and many um many uh turkeys oddly enough <laughs> a lot of turkeys and a lot of ducks this year so grizzlies were getting creative Oh, one really important thing before I leave this that I noted down here is that um, USDA Wildlife Services does a great job uh, picking up their the depredations and we're our you know responsibility is just to help them out in whatever way that they need. Um, we don't take the lead on that unless they ask us to. So um, the numbers that Wildlife Services is going to have could be a little bit different than us. Um, that may be something that if, you, if you're more curious about what the actual depredation numbers were out here, might be a livestock loss board question. Yeah, I think my, there we go. Okay, captures. Uh, we didn't have a lot of captures this year. We trapped and collared five management grizzly bears. Two of those were preemptive management captures and released on site. And then two, uh, Two were relocated by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service specialists. One was euthanized due to poor health. Uh, we participated in handling efforts with the Conrad Bear team when we could, but as the season went on, and you guys have talked about the food failure a lot, it hit us really hard and hit our black bears really hard. We had a lot of black bears coming out of the mountains and onto the plains and getting into trouble. We just didn't really have the time to respond to, or to help out Conrad team as much as we would have liked to on some of their handling. So didn't handle as many grizzly bears or collar as many. Uh, we had less mortalities this year, but they spiked toward the toward the end of the season. Um, you can see in that picture there, that's a really old uh, gal that I that I discovered or that a hunter discovered, and she uh, had been dead for a while. No, not sure about her cause of death, but um, she was very old. Uh, recovered the mains of eight bears. Four of them were management removals due to livestock. Uh, one was vehicle hit. One was removed due to illness. Uh, one after being wounded by a hunter, and then one on, pictured on the right was died of unknown causes. And then uh, community outreach, yeah, uh, this is kind of a thin slide, but uh, doesn't represent the, the work that we've done, uh, especially with the, our surrounding communities like Shoto, Dutton, and Augusta, and Fairfield. Um, you know, this is our second uh, second year here trying to get things rolling, and so, uh, and pick up where Madel left off. So, um, Basically, what we're, we're we're working with is the city to try to make sure that we can uh, keep bears from coming into town when uh, when there's food failures like there were this this recent year. We did have uh, quite a few bears get on the outskirts of town this year. Didn't have a whole lot of trouble that they caused. Um, you know, our grizzly bears out here, at least uh, in our first couple of years, seem to do a pretty good job supplementing their food with grain. Um, 
So yeah, we didn't have a lot of conflicts, but we did definitely have a couple and grizzly bears being in town is not a, not something that excites uh, people. So we try to respond to it pretty uh, aggressively if we can. Um, we work closely with city and community leaders across the East Front to give the most updated conflict prevention information um, and then just meet the needs of the communities. Different communities on the front have different needs and you know we try to try to keep up with them. Uh, we in it we we use the uh, neighborhood call trees out here on the Rocky Mountain front, which is basically if there's a bear sighted, you know, in somebody's neighborhood, um, we have, have call tree coordinators we can we can get in touch with, and then they can let everybody know in the area that there was a there's a grizzly bear, and you know keep your trash up and all that kind of stuff. <coughs> and uh, the primary uh, thing on that is that uh, we're trying to work on getting more of those going. But also trying to figure out when exactly is the best time to use them, because if you're over communicating every single time somebody sees a grizzly bear, uh, the message gets lost. So uh, we want to make sure that we're using it uh, in times when it's uh, got its most efficacy. Um, we use a call multiplier alert system. It's not very efficient. It's very expensive. We used it three times and that's when it's something more severe, like a, like an attack or something like that that people need to know about um or uh an event that's in that's inside city limits um and basically what that is is we record a message and that goes out that calls everybody who's signed up about four thousand people uh in our area and uh they get uh they get notified uh we have to manually input every single person and manually take out every person that no longer has is associated with the phone number that we have on record so it can be a lot of maintenance, um, but it's kind of the best way that we have without like using social media or something to communicate with people what's going on. Um, and we also work, you know, we work pretty closely with with local media, uh, statewide media as needed uh, in conjunction with Helena. <clears throat> We're working to find the best way possible to share vital information kind of as I noted, we, we don't have the most efficient ways. So I think going forward, that's something that we're going to continue looking at to try to be uh, better at. We did uh, have a chance of uh, all thanks to Conrad team for covering us for 10 days. Uh, we had a chance to get out there and uh, uh, do some trend trapping uh, in, the, in the South Fork of Sun River late june and early july unfortunately we didn't catch any grizzly bears and we didn't actually even detect any grizzly bears so um we don't uh don't know a lot about that area just yet but uh, it was a lot of fun and hopefully we can we can do some more next year so uh big thanks to freeze out lake staff they're really helpful this year um all the fwp supervisors wardens wardens are huge out here we work really closely with them all the office staff at region four biologists <coughs> teton county sheriff's office there are they're super helpful. I mean, uh, they a lot of people don't know to call us, and so they call Teton County, and Teton County gets in touch with us, and we're able to respond. Otherwise, we wouldn't even know that something was going on. <coughs> Excuse me. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Wildlife Services, and Forest Service personnel. Yeah, uh, working with Amber Cornack, Rory Trimbo a little bit, and then uh, and then obviously Hillary and Ben, great this year. So appreciate you guys, um, FWP Bear Managers. All you folks that have been doing this for a while and giving us uh, input when we need it. And then uh, the landowners and producers who allow us to work on their land. Um, that's a big privilege and we try to not take advantage of that. And then a special thanks to the Conrad team. Uh, yeah, they they they're our other half and they they help us uh, get get what we want done. So um, couldn't do it without them. That's all I've got, guys. Thanks, Daniel. It's great. Does anybody have any questions? Then it said something like chickens were added to the definition. I didn't catch the whole thing. Not yeah, sure so um, in, our, in our data that we analyzed, I just uh, everything that I use is off of our conflict database for the NCDE. So um, what I call a depredation uh, is based off of that that form and that form has uh, chickens on there, although uh, Wildlife Services doesn't um, doesn't you know may or may not elect to, to work to work on a chicken depredation. It is still technically a depredation. So I added those to our our numbers here, but um, is that the, news? The, not doing that last year? We did respond to chicken complex last year as well. 
or in the database. Did something change in the database? I thought you said something changed, but maybe I misheard you. Well, it, it's really a distinction of, of uh, level. So Wildlife Services doesn't consider chickens depredation unless it's a commercial operation. Right. And that's not necessarily the case. <laughs> well, that's you know, let's back up a whole okay. bunch if you don't think. <laughs> <laughs> so under there, there's a bunch of different livestock livestock definitions in Montana, right? So there's Department of Livestock, which is they oversee livestock in Montana, and chickens are classified as livestock under there. Now with Livestock Loss Board, they are not they do not consider chickens under their program because it was originally for compensation for wolves, wolves don't eat chickens. Well, grizzly bears got added later, grizzly bears eat chickens. Um, with wildlife services and fish, wildlife and parks on our, um, on the way we respond, we responded to chickens forever until uh, everybody fell in love with chickens, especially in region one. And so thank you, Jim. Jim took over chickens. So we gave it to region one, then it went to region two, region three is kind of here. And then just this year, the change is region four. Gary so eloquently said, we would love to do chickens. <laughs> I remember if you say so. <laughs> so it's just what wildlife services doesn't have the personnel. And so it, it's a matter of responding. Uh, we are actually doing that. Um, a lot of our non lethal stuff, Chrissy, we'll talk about that later, um, are rolling into that. But as far as going out, saying equipment, doing that stuff, we're trying to spread the, spread the joy with them. And, so and if the, that makes sense. However, that may change because, of course, uh, there's state law that says. Wildlife services must do an on-site investigation for compensation. Now there's the compensation piece, there's the management piece. If that is every year, the legislature tries to add more things to Georgia's program. That's why grizzly bears are there. That's why mountain lions are now there, which we investigate anyway with livestock. However, they're trying to add other species or whatever and other technically livestock like uh, beehives are considered livestock. And so if they add that to Georgia's program or chickens, then wildlife services would have to respond. According even, if to state it's, law. even if it's someone's little chicken coop with yep. five chickens. Yes, yeah, yeah. Five. And, 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 and part of that is if they pay per capita fee, because, okay, there's livestock in Montana under the Department of Livestock, right? Um, anybody who has a horse in here or a goat or a chicken, you're supposed to be paying taxes to the Department of Livestock. Um, a lot of people don't know that. A lot of people don't do that. So a caveat to the compensation piece is they are only compensated is if they pay per capita fee. However, the way the law is written, they can get a loss and go, okay, I'll pay my $5 to then now get compensated for my $5,000 horse. So it can be happen. So the two things too is, is um, Chickens aren't on the list of those things that can be compensated. Correct, they are not. So in, in the past, Region 1, chickens became an issue. Wildlife services really didn't have a whole lot of presence in Region 1 because of life. Livestock is not a big thing up there. Um, we at the front didn't have a whole lot of poultry-related conflicts. That has picked up in the last three to five years, mostly in the last two years. and because of the, the way we respond to conflict related to poultry, wildlife services doesn't have resources. We have been, been doing that. The only question I have is that since they are livestock and if they are out of the DMA, does wildlife service or, or does the US Fish and Wildlife Service now do relocations for chicken or poultry conflict? That's a question that has not been answered, and I haven't even thought about it until we just started multiple. And that's a great point, Gary. And I think this actually gets back to what Eric Lennon was saying. Um, there's hobby farms in Region 1. Over on the Rocky Mountain Front, it's all traditional ranches. And if they have a, a chicken house or whatever, they take care of it. Um, there isn't a lot of hobby farms where they just go down to Murdoch's and buy a couple chickens. And now that is starting to increase. Yes. Right. And, and where bears are spreading out. So, yeah. So that's, and I decided to not, you know, kill Ted North, actually. Jim Williams took over chickens. Jeez. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Craig. I appreciate that. That was a great explanation. And uh, if we were to take a look at conflict numbers, including livestock that the Craig's team deals with, these numbers would look a lot different. But these are just what we're reporting on 
how fish, wildlife, and parks is included in these responses. So of all the livestock conflict that happened on the front, these are the, the ones that were reported are the ones that, that we responded to in addition or in place of. So, hey, Craig, are you going to report on the conflicts that you guys respond to? I sure can. In, in a later thing, because that, that really does, what happens in their area with wildlife services responding to a lot of the things that we normally would joint do, but there's not enough manpower because of the number of conflicts we're seeing. If you looked at the conflicts that these guys are doing and wildlife services doing now, the numbers are going up and um, you add those up and it's it's uh, pretty significant. So did they answer your question? Well, yeah. good. Thanks. Awesome. Does anybody else have any questions? All right, thanks. All right, good job, Daniel. Nice job, Daniel. Thanks, Chad. Good. All right, so thanks, we everybody. are at our break time. Uh, what we're going to do is take a 15 minute break. So from 2.45 to 3, I know with this busy room, folks are going to start talking, but we are now behind the schedule. So when we come back, we, we aren't going to take questions till the end. We'll see how quickly we get through it. So for uh, Blackfeet, CSKT, uh, Glacier National Park, and uh, U.S. Forest Service and Wildlife Services will try to take the questions at the end to make sure we have time to get through everything. So that will be a little bit of a shift because uh, we just did get behind schedule. So with that 15 minute break, uh, be back shortly at three.
Yeah, thank you for coming. All right, thanks. Uh, my name is Jeff Florence, Black from for Black Creek Fishing My Life. Um, and these are going to be, I guess, my end of the report for now. I pulled traps yesterday morning to come to the meeting, so hopefully I don't have to send them back out. <laughs> uh, next. I want to acknowledge everybody that helped us this year. It was a pretty long year for us, busy from March to Pretty much yesterday, uh, fish, wildlife, and parks, uh, wildlife services. A lot of the park personnel helped us. Wildlife services um, had a lot of support. We had a new tribal council elected this spring. Had a lot of support from them. Sorry, Jeff. Um, I don't remember who else was on here, but there's a lot of a lot of people that helped us this year. Kind of accomplished what we wanted to. Um, Especially my workers, Tony, Peter, Landon, Richard, and Ethan. They kind of came and went to here now. Peter, Craig stole Peter. So, right. <laughs> uh, and our game wardens, <clears throat> they were a really great asset to us, especially after hours or when we had long days. And just the residents of the reservation that helped report and um, I guess go along with the education and things like that that we were doing. And this is just a collaboration of what we did. Uh, we got diving with wildlife services. This is uh, Milan, and then we were overdoing the search trapping. These are three of my techs. We caught uh, this guy outside of a, a lot of cattle feed that was dumped on the ground. And skipping with wildlife services and telling them that was uh, she was a non target bear had a depredation. So we just followed her to get her. <clears throat> our goals this year was to reduce bear human conflict on a reservation, complete uh, conflict prevention projects, a lot of electric kind of stuff. Work with the public to reduce conflict and public outreach and education. Uh, we also did a lot of presentations for the school groups, um, hunter safety classes, college classes. Uh, these are some, <clears throat> a lot of our problems were. Same thing everybody's doing, chicken coops. Uh, this is at one of our tribal campgrounds. <clears throat> Those are bear proof dumpsters, but we have really smart bears <laughs> that know how to tip them over and get in there. So we do electric fence around that. And then the other half is for food storage. And these, all of our tribal campgrounds have electric fences like that that we have built. Um, some of the private campgrounds are kind of getting on board with it. And then ducks. This is Landon, who actually goes to school here. And Morgan, who's Christian Wildlife Service, he, got, he was over on this project. He came over quite a bit. Uh, as for bear calls, 350 was just kind of what we kind of came up with. We had a lot more, uh, a lot of mistaken identity, a lot of black bears, and a lot of sightings. And my, <clears throat> I don't know how you guys feel. My theory to the black bears, everybody had a poor berry crop this year, was the grizzly bears were pushing the black bears off what natural feed there was. So they were coming in town a lot more. Um, I probably caught around 70 black bears this year. And unfortunately, I had to put a lot of them down. So, next. The conflicts <clears throat> unscared attractors, cattle depredation, structure break-ins, nuisance bears. This picture represents, we had a cattle feed program come through on a reservation that purchased a lot of feed for ranchers to cattle. With that, they didn't have anywhere to store it. So I think when you were putting the licks out, bears were getting into them, smelling the molasses and stuff, and finding it where they were storing it. So we put electric fence up around that, but even with that, we had a uh, Bears getting in there because they were already getting a reward inside. So sometimes at one night we had six bears in there. And it's maybe it's an area not even as big as this room. That molasses and the licks had melted into the ground and we could not, we could not get it out. So we put the fence up. The older bears would come in, the bigger males that we caught there would come in. And they would either twist wires or something, 
you know, sure, the fence up, they would allow all of it to come in. But as the fence kept working, what we saw, I think it's, it's in a couple slides later, but we have these younger bears, these sub-adults, walking up and down the outside the fence, even though it was grounded out. They had got shocked by it. They knew and they didn't want to come into it, but the older one would go in there and lay down. Actually, I think we caught three bears at this location. I Two in a culvert trap, three darn. So this one, uh, this is kind of a cabin pen pasture, electric fence. This is a sow and his three cubs, and then there's another male that's following them around. They ended up getting even more uh, trouble later on. Next. Um, depredation 65 investigation on cattle, 41 cattle depredations, two wolf depredations. I didn't count the chickens or the ducks or the beehives. Mm. And spring was probably the busiest with depredations. We had depredations everywhere. And <clears throat> it was hard to find target bears because we were having between three and eight bears on camera at single depredation sites. So it made it kind of hard to figure out which bears were doing what, but once we started figuring out the ones that were in the area consistently, we were, then we were able to start removing bears and can I stop? So we got the right bears out of all. <laughs> captures, we had 16 grizzly bear captures this year, nine management, eight females, one or eight males, one female, three non-target captured that depredation sites. Two males and female. And then four research captures, which was three females and a male. And unfortunately, I don't think that the female, one of the young females, I don't think she made it. And then the black bears. Uh, a lot of our calls, and I, I really stress this a lot this year that color is not a good way to identify bears because, it's, you know, oh, it's a grizzly bear, it's a grizzly bear. There's about to be a color big black bear. So, our collared bears, we have four research bears collared, two females that we collared on the reservation that moved off to Lewis and Clark, um, and then two from the park that on the reservation. Six management bears, there's four, four males and two females. One, we put a uh, family group in the last picture we caught one of the younger males, so we put a VHF collar on him. And um, her, unfortunately, the sow, the mother, her iridium isn't working. We're not getting downloads when the VHF is working. So it's kind of a bummer that we didn't have my guys work that over there that day. I mean, the only VHF collar we had to put on. <laughs> um, <clears throat> with the collars, too, we have one bear that Jordan, whose collars quit working, and sometimes she goes and visits Wesley now. Mm -hmm. um, mortalities, six management removals, I believe five of those were for depredations. One was uh, this bear right here, that's a, we never did figure out how she got hurt, but had like a club foot and almost looked like a bullet hole, but there was, I believe we opened it up between didn't call them the fragments or anything. Two by automobiles, three by planes. Um, one early on that was one of Wesley's bears. We never did figure out. It was, it was still under investigation. And then last week, I just got a picture of one. Um, so his paws cut off by a hunter. And I don't think he wanted to get in trouble, so he didn't tell us where it was at. I, mean, I, don't, I don't know if he killed it or not. So. Our conflict prevention projects, we put up five new 4 H electric fence projects. Um, I got a grant two years ago, $50,000 to BIA to specifically do, it was a youth initiative grant, and it was to put up electric fence around all 4 H animals on reservation. And that's been going pretty well for us. Uh, these other projects were just around ducks and beehives and things like that. 
I, the repairs were probably a lot more than that, but those were our major repairs where we actually went out and spliced and had to spend time to figure out what was going on with the fences. And some of these participants went from pigs to steers, these 4 H, so we had to go out and either expand or build new projects for them. Uh, we have about 60 plus fences that we help maintain. And in maintaining, we go out in the spring and we hook everything up, make sure everything's working. And then we kind of turn it over to them and let them do it. They all have testers and things like that. And if you don't have a tester, you grab it. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a lot of projects slated for this spring. I just found out about last week. So <laughs> it's like it's going to be a busy spring. <laughs> and then, like I said, that. We already looked at those two pictures. Here's the picture I was talking about, kind of a sub adult on the outside of the fence, just walking the fence line, and the other bears on the inside. This is uh, my best picture with Steve with the Park Service, working with the Wildlife Service, our Fish and Wildlife Service, and Milan with FWP. Yes. And Steve had a problem in the park, just inside St. Mary's, inside the park. Bears chewing up sewer lines coming out of camp. So I had some horse trailer mats and a couple temporary electric fences that we just tore up anyway. We cut up, put them on mats, electrified them. Mary never did come back, but we got video of skunk in shops. <laughs> I think we put three or four of those out that day. That was, that was pretty good. It took four agencies to figure all that out. <laughs> Next. Yeah, the, like I said, the electric fences are very effective, especially on the younger bears. Older ones seem, I mean, once they were into all of that feed in that one area that they they just knew if they handled that one shock, they were going to get all the feed they want. Some depredations, we have a very large, I think it's almost 40 acre electric fence for a calving pasture. And it runs good, but <clears throat> The guy made it all the way until his last three calves, and they ended up getting killed inside of the electric fence. Um, we have another project, I think it's around 30, 32 acres or something, so, like 30, so kind of a bigger one. And in all the tribal campgrounds, we have a lot of black bears that were in trying to get in trash just throughout the whole year, and I mean, they hit the fence and never come back. So. That worked out pretty well. Uh, our challenges, a lot of calls, a mistaken identity, trap shy bears, blackbird conflict, solid waste issues, and a lot of their dumpsters, uh, their trash trucks that dumps the dumpsters break down, bear proof cans being broken. Public not reporting in a timely manner was, was kind of a big issue because <clears throat> we'd get a call we respond to it and it be, oh, this was last week, or you know, two weeks ago. Um, unsecured attractants, like I said, the cattle feed was a big, big thing for us this year. Um, and then just the population expanding away from the front. Um, the public tolerance was one that a lot of these guys that were losing cattle or bears getting in a crate and stuff, they were getting frustrated because we couldn't travel. Or we couldn't catch all and uh, I was kind of short staffed here and there just due to funding and long hours and late hibernation we still have a lot of bears that are out and about Thanks. so this is the feed that was done the guy was supposed to use his tractor but being that had six bears and I said I'll say call the traps it's kind of crazy we had a uh, we had pictures. It didn't come on that one trail camera. But we had pictures of all the bears like laying there eating. And he watches one and they're all looking at him, looking at him, and he goes into the trap and the door drops and they're just looking at him. <laughs> <laughs> um this was an electric friends, the big one where the calves got killed and the bear just came in and crossed the ground wire to a hot fire and shorted it out. Uh, Real smart trap shy bears. 
This was on a depredation. Um, he dug the whole pipe set up and he even set the screen off. I mean, just really careful about what he did. That's the sow. That's a bait site I had in that tree stand that I set in, try to dart him. I had her coming in, but pretty sporadically, we couldn't ever pattern her because she was initially caught at that bait site. So we tried a few times to get her to switch her collar up, never panned out for us. And that's, that's about it. Awesome. And again, unfortunately, we'll wait until the end, but if you're hanging around just in case we have time. Awesome. Thank you so much. No problem. Nice job, Jeff. We're switching gears to CSKT. Thanks, Dylan. You have the yep. Peyton's coming up. Peyton. Did I grab the wrong one? Yes, I did. Yeah. <laughs> I got too many zip drives over here. And the next <laughs> one's here is the blue one. Yep. Oh, there we go. Sorry. We've got a PDF. It's got a lot of words on it. Um, try not to just read it. Um, a couple photos. But yeah, I'm Peyton Adams, biologist with CSKT. Uh, Peyton and Carrie are remote, so if they have anything to say, they can chime in as well. Um, but yeah, this year, like many others in the area, we worked black bears as well as grizzlies. And so, like everybody said, the crops and everything went to really busy black bear years. Um, we probably dedicated about 80% of our time to black bears in the, during the summer, which caused the, the grizzly our efforts toward the grizzlies to kind of fall off a little bit. So um, we had, of the callers that we did have out, or that we had that we wanted to get out, um, they had a geofence along Highway 93. Um, they were really interested in seeing where the grizzlies were crossing the highway so that we could see their crossing structures became more effective. And then if they are using structures to see what type of structures are. Um, you can scroll down. I, I don't want to read through just the interviews, so I'll touch on all that stuff. If we did. But um, uh, as far as outreach and kind of prevention stuff, we hosted a Bear and Cider Festival. Uh, it was a big success last year. So this year we, we did it again. We tried to kind of improve it. We had Chuck Barbaugh there. Um, he drew in some, some people because we had him put stuff there right by the highway. So that would have been some people. Um, we probably had about 200 local residents come through, um, press their apples. We had um, a local family who had an orchard donate about 500 plus pounds of apples the day of the event. Um, and if we didn't have that, the event, we probably would have had probably, you know, two, three families press 10 to 20 pounds of apples. But luckily, we had that opportunity. So that made it a really good, successful event. Um, we also monitored our Mission Valley Fruit Planning page. Uh, we kind of took a little bit from the Flathead Valley Fruit Planning and the Missoula Fruit Planning pages, made our own, and uh, trying to get people who have fruit trees put in contact with people who want to get that fruit off the landscape. And it's where it's an issue. We tried to encourage people who not to go out into the woods and pick apples to bring you know, somewhere where it's safe for the bears to, to eat. Uh, but we did have free loaner equipment at a few locations on the reservation where people could go just sign their name, take fruit pickers or a tarp or a box to pick their apples. We probably had one person do that, but we're still trying to get the word out. We're working on it. We did probably, we estimate that we probably were able to take about a thousand pounds of apples. Through the landscape. Um, a lot of the, the pulp from the, the event and then uh, even some of the apples donated went to Ted Norton because uh, he's got pigs. So uh, his pigs took care of those, the uh, leftovers in a matter of hours, I presume. Um, we did have, or we, we do have uh, bear spray that we make available to 
people who have their conservation permits and tribal members for just a, a fee, a one time fee of $15. Just an easy way that we can kind of use uh, funding that we have to provide a service to people who want to recreate on our lands um, and encourage people to buy their permits, which is harder than it seems. Um, this year, we were able to get 122 more Kodiak cans. We just got those all done and ready to be given away, basically, because they're uh, we give them to any resident on the reservation for a one-time fee of $20. We keep it as long as they want. So it's a steal. <laughs> um, Republic Services won't touch those, so they're just for people who self-haul. But we have noticed in certain areas where, where we get those out to people, in Southwest, which has been uh, instrumental. Um, to, in total, we think that we have provided about 385 because that's the highest number sticker that we have left that's not on a trash can. <laughs> we don't know if we missed a section of trash cans through the years, but we estimate that that's about how many we have. Um, we responded 34 grizz, grizzly bear calls. Of those, 21 were conflicts. 13 more observations, uh, a bunch of different you know, reasons behind those. I'll, I'll kind of get into those later. Um, we helped install six electric fences specifically for grizzly conflicts that we confirmed were grizzly conflicts. Um, other than that, we did 20 other loaned equipment or fence projects for black bears. Uh, 61 total trap nights, um, including all the traps that we had. Uh, for grizzly specific, um, we really would have hoped to get that number up. And hopefully, in the next year, if the Golden Bears are capable of handling more of the of the uh, black bear conflicts, now that they have that, that would get those in there. Uh, we set out bear rub posts, um, just a post in the ground from from Hunt Stimbers that Eric Graham helped us. Uh, it, he actually gave us a bunch of them, um, but yeah, just a post with barbed wire that we put out um, in areas where we know the grizzly is frequent, and for some reason they key in on them. And a lot of black bears do, but grizzlies also like to use those. Um, and because of that, we were able to get 18 opportunistic DNA samples. Um, that and then just barbed wire fences near dead beds, but um, a lot of a lot of uh, DNA samples from that from those things. And then this is where our conflicts are occurring, uh, pretty much all within the Mission Valley area. Uh, we hardly have anything on the western side of the reservation. And this one female here, she came over from Fondin area. Somehow, I think she's probably from here because she basically beelined it straight to that cornfield, stayed there all summer, and then came straight across, and now she's in. I think she's still back but um yeah she uh was interesting it was nice to have another collar female to watch because we put out two collars and ended up falling off but um yeah she just stuck to herself her two yearlings and they sat in corn and got fat all summer and they left <laughs> um so a breakdown further down there's a breakdown of the different calls and conflicts. Um, pretty typical for us, um, the things that we see year to year. We don't have a big issue just in general with, with livestock. Um, we don't have an issue with cattle really, really haven't before. Um, a lot of the depredations and the things with livestock that we did see in the chickens or Goats or sheep or milk, and just many little puppies. We did have five. One family lost five donkeys to grizzly uh, family group. Um, but one thing I want to touch on was the livestock that non depredation. There were two, and this is where that photo is. There were two that were, one was somebody had their cattle being chased. I don't know if it was super reliable source. Not the best photo, but um, if you see the little white thing under this grizzly, that's a duck. And when we got there, 
that duck was chilling. <laughs> that duck survived. It got attacked to the people. They pulled in their driveway, um, let their dogs out, and their dogs ended up chasing Frisca's off. She took this photo just before the dogs were in out there. But that duck popped up and didn't have a scratch on it, but somehow was pinned under this cub and survived. I think probably the only duck that's ever been attacked by a ghost <laughs> and survived. Um, so that I just thought that that was interesting, and I wanted to add more thoughts to my slide show. <laughs> um, but yeah, other than that, um, pretty a uh, pretty typical uh, year given. Yeah, you know, overall, uh, I felt like I mean, especially compared to some other people. Around. Um, we had a pretty easy year. <laughs> we didn't have a whole lot um, of all these. It was um, only a handful stand out as you know, really kind of time consuming conflicts that we had to put a lot of energy in, but also too. So, yeah, this is one of the sows that we caught, Huey. Um, she was a recapture from um, uh, Carrie's graduate work. Uh, this is she's in the trap. Those are her two two year olds. They greeted us when we came and uh, decided to move that that trailer. We had a warden that was tasked with keeping an eye on on the woods, making sure that he had um, some cracker shells, making sure that they stayed in the woods while I hooked up the trailer. As soon as we get out there, he's asking how we can help hook up the trailer, and I'm hearing grunting, and I step out because the because Cooley's in the trap, I step out because I think it might just be her, but then I realize it's over here. But I tell him to go away <laughs> and let me hook up the trigger so that we could. And then we saw two big, they were about the same size as her. And uh, we presume that they dispersed sometime later that, that same summer, this same summer. Uh, but before this, there was a two year old uh, male that we caught. Uh, we named him Papa because my initials are PA and Peyton's initials are PA. So, and it was our first pair together. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we caught him and collared him in April. He held his collar until August and then managed to get it all just above placid legs. So he's someone else's. Um, then Cooley, she was recaptured. Uh, she was with her cubs. There was a cow carcass that was dumped somewhere it shouldn't have been that we heard about, and we got out there, and she was still out there. So we took the trap, and it was pretty. It was actually a really fast capture, which was good. Um, but yeah, then she was documented crossing the highway eight different times. Um, we assume, we presume that it was all accurate. That there's not any structures where she crossed. Um, and then we also assumed that she was alone because that was all in September or later. So um, we, we assumed that her cubs had dispersed. Uh, we did have one conflict male that we captured, one conflict grizzly that we captured. He had been seen and we had been received photos of him around the Nine Pipes area near the lodge. And we, um, we, Tried at I think four different locations to catch him and he just kept moving. He was actually edging closer and closer to Ted Moore's house. And so I told Ted that we should probably secure his pigs. Um, <laughs> because somehow he doesn't secure his pigs. But um, he man we managed to catch him up there <laughs> separate instant at the top. Well, yeah, hopefully I didn't get him. <laughs> But um, we finally did catch him after he had gotten into some things, killed some chickens. Um, but we caught him uh, we, it was, uh, in late July, so we took him back to the office to work him up, hoping that we could reduce the environmental factors. Uh, unfortunately, he did end up getting too hot. We had to reverse him preemptively. Um, I think we still did get an ear tag and a pit tag in him and get uh, blood and hair, but I think we missed on some of the measurements uh, and then released him into the south level of the job and haven't had any heard anything since and then we had an incidental female get captured 
uh, but in the game where there's, there's black bear conflict in, a, in somebody's yard and they set the trap at the edge of that field. Um, and caught a grizzly who had two yearly, two cubs of the year. Um, we released her on site. She didn't receive a collar. Um, and then she was seen a couple weeks later um, in the same area. So she's still hanging around. Uh, we did have one mortality, I guess. Uh, I guess you could call it. You can scroll this down. Um, we had a pheasant hunter find a grizzly skull um, about this time last year. And uh, we got the skull from him. He flagged the area where the exact spot where he got it. We went out there, didn't find a single thing. And the skull is completely clean. Um, no, nothing, no wounds or like gunshot wounds or anything. Um, so we have no idea, but we did pull a tooth so we could at least get an age and maybe yeah, but um, and it's in my office. It's cool, giant bear skull. So, um, we did have the one pheasant hunter that um, <laughs> was charged by a, a grizzly with two cubs. Um, he fired off two shots. I, we don't know. This this was the day that Peyton and I were in Lake Tahoe for the the uh, human bear conflict workshop. So. Um, we the wardens went out with metal detectors, didn't find shells, didn't find blood, didn't find really tracks or any really anything. So we're not sure what happened there. Um, it was in an area where we know there are grizzlies, um, area where a lot of in pheasant hunters hunt. So, um, yeah, we're not sure about that one. And then Ronnie. The, the Saturday joined us for a few months and then ate a bunch of corn and left. Um, she came over. And yeah, just I'd like to thank uh, all of these people. Um, specifically, I want to thank Lori and Mimon and Chrissy and Russ and the people that actually got to work with on the, on the ground, um, people that you know, Peyton and I are new to this position and have some pretty big shoes to fill. So it's nice to have any help that we can get. So, yeah, thank you. Thanks. So we didn't clap for uh, either Jeff or you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next up is uh, John for Salvation National. You're on virtual. And John, just to give you a time frame, uh, there's Glacier National Park, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Wildlife Service for uh, 25 minutes left. So that's what, eight minutes apiece? <laughs> okay, can you hear me okay? Sure can. All right, well, I'll just make it short. Uh, we didn't have a super busy year. It was an uh, interesting, unique year in some ways. I think a lot of the other specialists noted how they felt that the late spring snows were keeping bears down at lower elevations. And I agree with that because uh, we started off our spring with bears getting into some of our bear resistant garbage cans and dumpsters, which was sort of unusual, but it had been happening. This is about the third time in a row it happened, but we finally had some employees get eyes on the culprits and it confirmed that they it was a grizzly bear and we were able to capture it and put a collar on it did a hard release on site and it uh, left the park shortly thereafter and started causing conflicts outside the park and so fwp had to remove that bear so that was too bad uh, but that bear his mother is still around and i suspect maybe our instances of can clouding isn't over uh, but we are in the process of upgrading our cans to a newer style so hopefully that'll help solve the problem we weren't able to take many bears for relocation this year because in the spring uh, the access was terrible just because of the late snow uh, so we did take one family group from fwp uh, wesley mentioned that during his report uh, I, I guess the unique thing was that maybe because of the late snow we had a lot of uh 
management time spent uh, with grizzly bears hunting moose calves near the developed areas. And there's a couple neat ones on YouTube. If you haven't seen them, they're pretty amazing. One was uh, a grizzly bear taking a moose calf right next to the Many Glacier Hotel. There's a moose cow with two calves in Swift Current Lake right next to the hotel. And the grizzly bear kind of snuck in and grabbed one of those calves. But then it came back for the second one and the the cow was having none of that. So she chased it away and the bear ran right into the plate glass window on the front of the Many Glacier Hotel. So that was our first incidence of grizzly bear caused property damage in the park for the year. The other incident was, uh, uh, you can see this on YouTube too, is a couple reciting their wedding vows along to Medicine Lake. And in the background, a grizzly bear jumps on a moose calf and starts killing it. So there's a lot of bawling and thrashing about. So that became the, su the subject of the video. So I don't know if those people ever got married or not. But <laughs> only in Glacier. Uh, we had another property damage incident where a grizzly bear uh, took some bicycles away from some mountain bikers on the inside North Fork Road and chewed their seats off. Uh, and then we had a couple incidents of bears getting into backpacks, uh, but we weren't ever really able to. We put an electric backpack out at Iceberg Lake where we had an incident and got some footage of the bears walking right by the bear backpack and never touched it again. So I guess it worked out OK. Uh, but despite all all that, we didn't have any mortalities or management removals of grizzly bears this year. Uh, we did have an unusual number of bears pepper sprayed this year. There are at least over a dozen instances this year, which seemed uh, a little high for us. Uh, and then three grizzly bears were captured and collared in the park as part of the trend monitoring program. But that's all I got. Excellent. Nice job, John. You made up some time. <laughs> all right. So round of applause. All right, Rory and Amber. Pull her up. Four minutes apiece. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be quick. Um, so first off, I just want to thank everybody uh, for working with us. I know that in the beginning this was frustrating and this is all very new and it's um, there was a lot going on. So I just I really do want to thank everybody that worked with us and um tolerated us pushing can we help can we help what can we do <laughs> uh so we did um quite a few relocations so we did four males in the north continental divide ecosystem four females and then two family groups um education wise we attended either collaboratively or on our own um, we did seven of those and then per we just accounted permanent electric fences and we did five of those and again those are all collaboratively or like Rory did three by himself. <laughs> um, so we did, I, I feel like we we got a lot done in the area. Not only that, we also worked with the GYE, Bitterroot. Like I said, we were reaching out to everybody. We worked with Humanis. We tried to do a lot of trainings. Uh, I will say it took a little bit for us to get started. And those, if you guys know the feds, those first couple months were a lot of paperwork and trainings and sitting in front of the computer for us. Um, so hopefully next year we'll, we can just jump right in and we won't have too much of that. Um, I think I we think that everything went really smoothly and like I, I can't thank you guys enough for being so welcoming. And like I said, I know this is new um, and I hope that we were helpful and able to get a lot more work done and, and that's what we're here for. So. Um, I think that's kind of all I had. We helped out with Idaho Fishing Game too, up in Northern Idaho and Wayne's crew. Um, we helped out in the Bitter Room with Jen's crew too as well. So um, like I said, we just tried to jump on where we can. So if there's anything more that we can do, we're, we're here to help and we're our permanent. And so I will say the one question I think we yielded a lot was, so what are you guys doing again? <laughs> Um, but please, I mean, feel free to to throw us in things that maybe you guys don't want to do or, or anything. So, does anybody have any questions? Yeah, we'll see if there's questions. Is Rory coming up? 
No, I like Phil. Yeah, she covered. Are you covered, Phil? Yeah. All of a sudden, we do have time for questions. <laughs> All right, we'll switch it over to Craig. Yeah, I give yours, and then we might have time for questions for any of the uh, of both tribes or anybody else if there's. So okay, if I just sit here. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Whatever's comfortable for you, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> um, first off, thanks to all the partners in this room and and those that aren't. If I started to list everybody, it would take up all the time. But each and every one of you, thank you very much. I really appreciate it, especially the the folks in the bill. Um, and it's easy to be a bureaucrat, right? And oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so wildlife services, uh, it, it was a bad barrier, but looking at historical stuff with as far as the livestock goes, it wasn't any big banner year, surprisingly enough. Um, we confirmed 112 uh, cattle depredations, uh, 59 sheep, uh, one horse was a, a probable, and then a couple uh, mini donkeys. Uh, that said, um, damage wise, was about $411,000 is what we figured. Last year was 387,000. The year before that was 462,000. Uh, what my theory was, what I saw is um, up along uh, uh, the Blackfeet Reservation Glacier down um, along the, the Rocky Mountain Front was probably the highest level of depredations um, down into that Augusta area. I think that was the hardest hit with drought. And I think for producers, you couldn't hardly miss a dead calf because there was no grass out there. You could see everything. I think that was a, a, a big a big part for some of the producers. Anyhow, so that's that's kind of kind of where that's at. I actually looked at our black bear damage too, and our black bear damage on livestock was kind of in on par with what what it's hap what's happened uh, in in the past. We captured or we captured or removed uh, 20 individuals in the NCDE. 13 of those were captures, seven of those were shooting. Um, and that was, it was chronic depredations and it's those areas, uh, the, the southern part of uh, the Blackfeet Reservation, uh, a little bit further in some of those uh, river corridors there, like Wesley was talking about, trying to get the community um, uh, to, to maintain support for the, the program. Uh, in the springtime, when those calves hit the ground and bears come out, uh, we have about 10% uh, of those individuals actually come back to the depredation site because there's really nothing to come back to, or they just don't, or they don't like the look of a culvert trap or whatever. Because in the springtime, it's harder to hard trap, right? harder to set foot snares, all that stuff. So the success rate is, is pretty low. Um, but anyhow, uh, there was some depredations there didn't catch anything. And then that family group was was feeding on a, a big one and, or a, a dead bull or a cow. I can't remember what it was with the cow. And so um, really want to show my appreciation to Gary Berlotti and, and Wesley for, for doing that. That was big for the community. And then, of course, it's just like, well, what have you done for us lately? Because it's soon forgot. <laughs> As you know, but that's it, it's, it's trying and it, it was a good thing. Um, so anyhow, that was some of the hot spots, and then of course from Augusta down to Highway 200, there was a lot of depredations in there. Uh, there was over nine different producers, so it's not just one producer. Uh, a lot of different bears. There was some removals in there, and then of course, uh, like JV was saying, down around um, Lincoln and, and Obando, there was some depredations down there. One, one big depredation that lasted quite a while. There was uh, quite a few sheep, but that was where the bear actually was testing the dogs and oh. Uh, Peyton, by the way, um, Ted North, have you ever seen all his, all of his dogs? His <laughs> picture's secure. <laughs> he has more guard dogs than anybody. I think. Little rat terriers. <laughs> and, um, so uh, testing the guard dogs a lot, and then it's just to the point where you know they they move the sheep down as close as they could to their to their cabin, um, had herders. Uh, did a bunch of stuff anyhow the interesting thing on that after it went in and, and killed a bunch and then there was wounded once for a little while there were no other bears that showed up and i was shocked about that um there was no other other bears in that area over the course of you know maybe a week eight eight or nine days so um that that was that was pretty interesting and then another funny thing the neighbor had a trail camera out just they have a trail camera 
and there was a picture of a bear with a live view in its mouth on the trail camera, like running, and the U's got this big surprise look on her face. So that was kind of interesting. But anyhow, I, I know I'm more with that. <laughs> um, so as far as damages goes, that's where we're at. Um, oh, uh, so Lewistown, that's starting to be uh, a thing with grizzly bears. We responded to some beehive damage over there to a sow and a yearling. Um, that's uh, four years ago. There was two males that came down to Marias and were out there just outside of Stanford not too long. They killed some calves. Those were removed. Um, last year, there was a big male south of Lewistown that was killing adult cattle. Um, and then this female showed up and it's 11 miles west of Lewis Center. And the, the bee producer out there um, is, is, a, is a pretty big producer, it has over 600 hives and 150 of those are electrified. So, I mean, it's not like he's not part of that. So anyhow, um, due to all the all the stuff that, that happens in the field of, of timing and personnel and weather and, and all that stuff, that bear was never captured. We actually think that the female kicked off the yearling because then she just started showing up. And I mean, you look at the Jude River, it's pretty awesome. It's, it's a big river corridor. So anyhow, that'll that'll be interesting to see see what comes of it. So I did some um, some education in that area. They had a bunch of schools from uh, three counties come there. So Fergus and Jude Basin um, and I think where's the other one? Anyhow, um, they they brought a bunch of kids in for kind of a, a, a Bear and I went there and did the the big you know education on bear and bear aware and all that stuff. So that was that was actually well received. Um, I think that's about it as far as that goes. And then also uh, we have a a big non lethal side and and I'll get into that a little bit tomorrow on our program stuff. But just the non lethal uh, teamwork that we did. Adam Bach is no longer here. Uh, uh, Chrissy Lambert is is now um, here in his place. But that team worked on 107 different projects, either electrifying or doing some range riding. Uh, that's uh, another bigger part, and I'll, I'll talk about that more. So that was that was quite a big thing. So, any questions? But Craig, yeah. um, just to focus in on that Augusta South and West, one of the things that we're running into, and, and you ran into it multiple times, is that when we get a depredation, there's so many bears at that site and not being and this is i mean this year we've really um focused in on that area but we've seen it along the front for years um one of the techniques that we're using now and maybe kind of go over that is that when you can't tr you can't put a trap in there because there's so many bears what we're what we're seeing in a, a technique that we're using now is that we don't know which bear it is what we're doing is allowing you guys have have come up with a plan that We'll sit out there and wait and find out what bear that is. It may take multiple nights or whatever. And then we're, if it's a removal that we're looking at, you guys are not even trapping. You're actually removing them on site um, legally. And that has kind of been a uh, taboo in the past, but it's becoming more and more regular because of the number of bears that are showing up at one site. We can't di distinguish which bear actually created that. And there's so many depredations that are happening in those areas along that Augusta South that um, this technique is actually starting to work uh, to, to identify the exact bear that's doing it and then figuring out what to do with that bear. So I, I just uh, maybe your comments along those lines. Well, and this is something that, you know, that all the bear specialists have talked about. I mean, there's, you know, and Jeff said it, there's three to eight bears that show up on these depredations and, and, and it depends on these areas. It's these really chronic hot spots. Uh, we actually, you know, it stems from an area you can't even logistically get a trap into. Or, I mean, you can snare maybe off horseback or whatever, but, you know, all you're going to do is capture non-targets. A good a good percentage. I mean, um, we, we have the luxury of using the helicopter um, doing other work, and you see 10 bears in this pasture where they're having a cattle depredation daily. And so if you and and so it's it gets down to you're trying to tease that out. And honestly, a lot of times it ends up to be, and I shouldn't say a lot, but a higher percentage, more than half, 
it's smaller females that are very efficient in killing cattle. And the cleanup crew, we call it, the other bigger males come in and push them off or whatever, and then she just goes and kills another one. And so a lot of times we're, we're measuring track sizes, but I mean, that just says what bears have been there. So we're really trying to key on um, canine spacings as far as maybe just small, medium, large. I don't know if that's really, I mean, we're, we're trying to make the best educated guess. And then of course, how often do you see a grizzly bear actually killing? Right. I mean, so that's that's the hardest thing. However, there have been several instances where we have identified the bear, removed it, and depredations that were chronic stopped. So I think that that's a positive thing. I mean, I, I really do. And I think it, the reason I mentioned that because it has been effective in reducing conflict in areas where we've had series after series after series of depredations and so many bears in that area and not knowing which one it is. This seems to have good effect on, on what we're seeing. And, and honestly, I think it's better for, for the bears because we're not capturing on targets. I mean, that would be good for cars and whatever, but if we don't have to handle a bear if, you know, while I serves them, why should we, why should we be capturing on targets? So yeah, that's a good point. Okay, we've got about eight minutes left. If you want to have any other questions, either to Craig or any of the other speakers after break. Go ahead, Hillary. We have a question for Peyton. Um, do you think about um, the latest? I don't know if the tribe has had any discussions on the compost site that you guys were thinking about. This was a few years ago. And kind of related to that, the, the issue going on with Lake County and the current first Yeah. Hey, do you want to jump up so we can make sure to hear? Yeah, and also carry or pay the paper. Um, the Trans well, the issue was a satellite station, satellite waste station um, that was earlier this spring. It just got overrun by black bears. Um, it was this is one right on ninety three, just off ninety three. Uh, yeah, it's from San Diego, Valley. Um, the yeah, the Valley Creek uh, site, but. They they had roll away downstairs there. People could pull up their trash. They it was unmanned. There was somebody there a couple times. Would be basically just replacing um, things. And we tried working with them. Carrie put in a lot of work, uh, just trying to reach out to the waste management. And they really weren't interested in anything they had to say. We also worked with people on carnivores. Um, and I believe defenders are actually also involved and they didn't want to electrify, they didn't want to try to even just close the, the lids and try to have some type of reinforcement closure. We were having people throwing trash in and bears are in there. So, uh, and the, the whole health management was um, so what they ended up doing is closing it down for two weeks. Pissed off everybody in the area because the nearest place that they get all their trash to is Charlotte. So it added a, a whole lot of travel time for people to brought together. Um, and then uh, they decided to have it open three days a week with somebody there and limit, really limited hours. And then all it ended up doing is the gate just gets piled of garbage. How <laughs> fuck? People don't want to change their behavior and well, so they just leave it out front or right around the corner. There was like another man that was just like that it was already an issue with people who like my collections. They were just going so um it I guess it kind of resolved the bear issue, the bears did move on. Uh, and I don't think they will have solution. it would be nice to, to try to come to some agreement and do something collaboratively, but it just it didn't really. um the compost site, I believe that 
Well, Carrie can definitely touch on that. Because I, I believe that we we had it around the top. Honestly, we didn't have the so. Okay, but nothing, nothing new on that. I don't know. So. But yeah, yeah and I can. Cool. I can definitely hop in there, Peyton. Um, so yeah, definitely with the compost site, we did have some conversations early, early this year um, with Lake County Transfer Station about they had a potential site near um, kind of an old Kerr Dam dump area where the city was thinking of and evaluating a site for a possible composting area. But um, so we were, hoping to kind of coordinate with them on maybe kind of a cooperative composting site, but um, I don't know what sort of happened in that progress, um, but they, I think, deemed that it wasn't a site that um, would support compost very well. Um, for, you know, and I didn't see the analysis or anything because the gentleman who was working on that also left um, kind of in the late, you know, mid to late summer as well. So, I mean, yeah, we're right now kind of back to square zero again. <laughs> I feel like we, you know, just kind of keep getting a glimmer of hope and then working towards that, you know, putting some steps down and then just kind of having things not work out. So we're still at this point looking into, you know, what are some of our other options? Um, we did have a carcass um, removal kind of program we tried to get off the ground this year. We don't have any equipment, trailers, or trucks to pick up um, dead livestock from landowners, but we do have, we did have dedicated money to where if a landowner could get that carcass to the landfill, we would, you know, pay for that disposal. But we didn't have um, anybody utilize that this year, even though we put the word out um, to quite a few landowners and even some conflicts that Peyton and Peyton were working. You know, we'd let people know that we could um, pay for that carcass disposal and people still um, didn't utilize that program. So we're now we're trying to reevaluate to see how we can roll that out next year, hopefully with a bit more success. Um, and then, yeah, on that Valley Creek site, you know, we worked with people in carnivores and I think PNC was even ready to help get some money and funding put in place to get like a hydraulic lift for the top of the um garbage kind of cans and you know they just really weren't interested in any sort of um, mitigation or remediation efforts so i mean we talked to them clear back in january february of this year and then you know just couldn't get anyone to respond to us and then it kind of culminated early spring when they started having conflicts so that was unfortunate but um yeah we did everything we could there <laughs> Thanks, Karen. All right, we have time for one more quick question. If we have one. All right, we're going to switch gears then a minute early. Um, I, I, I don't want to. This really isn't all about me. I, I'd rather have Bruce kind of tell the story of these little bears from the Bitterroot, but we we made a little animation of their movement after they were collared. So Bruce, if you don't mind kind of telling us about these bears. And then I just wanted to let everyone know that Milan was the one that helped make this little animation. <laughs> but yeah. I'll explain what's what's in the animation. What the colors are. Just so there was a female and a male. Um, the little red dots are places where they know that this pair was observed. The little green dots are where they think that, that they might have come through and even where they cross I-90. And then these paths that you're seeing are their paths after they were captured and moved and what they did. So right now, the green one that you can see is the female. The male's collar didn't start collecting data immediately. So he has got a little bit um, delayed in terms of data, but she just crossed I-90 um, going back east and he's just about to cross the I-90. And she came, she went over by Ovando and then she just headed up into 
the area of the scapegoat wilderness. He's kind of following a different path, but going in the same general direction. Um, this is about the middle of October. You can see the date up there at the top. They essentially reunited. <laughs> That's a distance of like 75 miles. And they, they're they so close together that there's potential that they're in the same day together. And we're going to be really fascinated to see what they do next year. But I just thought that was kind of an interesting story. If Bruce wants to give a little more information about what they were yeah, just uh, how they were two, caught. Two year old grizzly and start getting reports of them uh, around Potomac and then Bonner and then uh, Tura. They were uh, seen trying to cross the highway. And the uh, president got a uh, good video of them there. After that, they picked up on the MPG Ranch, on Sapphire Ranch. They're mainly uh, sticking to large, uh, large properties cow producers and it kind of bounced around the north end. Um, we were debating what to do with them. Uh, and we had one date, but we had another uh bear conflict. So we had to kind of switch gears and then they kind of made the decision for us. They started spending a lot of time around uh, human belt areas being seen uh, photograph on trail cams, talking over trash cans. All the trash cans in the photos were empty, actually, but uh, not a good look, so we decided to mm -hmm. capture them, call them, and we relocated that to uh, uh, two days in front of Cool. Yeah, I'm catching them on a bone yard. A uh, user had a lot of dead stock in his bone yard. Um, it was actually the neighbor had a trail camera up and the neighbor to let us know. Producer knew that he may have been off of the property and he didn't have a problem with me in there. Um, they were the people that were having issues or a problem with their friends were kind of like, I believe it's there. Uh, they have been drinking one of the branches and hockey farms. Let's catch some money. You shall bring them down. A lot of threats. Thanks, Bruce. Um, so, I do have a question for hopefully someone is ready to talk about uh, the NCBE conservation strategy, kind of the 101 aspect. If not, we've missed the ball. Oh, good. Got loads of presentation. Yay. Thanks for sharing, Bruce. Definitely appreciate that. That's pretty cool. We'll see how they emerge, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So again, the purpose of this, we've had a lot of turnover in the last few years, including myself. So this is kind of again 101 course from your uh, college courses. It's back to the basics, <laughs> right? Yes. All right. Okay. So as Kurt said, there's been a lot of turnover, not only at the subcommittee meeting, subcommittee, but also at the Yellowstone subcommittee. And the South Kirk Cavaniac subcommittee is talking about starting a conservation strategy there. So we thought this would be a good time to give an overview of conservation strategies, how the previous ones have been developed and kind of what their contents are. Um, stand up here so hopefully they're okay um so we're going to start with an overview the purpose the process the contents and then the implementation of the conservation strategies so the recovery plan our most recent recovery plan which is 1993 i know it's old um outlines two requirements for delisting one of those requirements is to obtain the population demographic criteria the second is to develop a conservation strategy to ensure that that population will maintain recovery after delisting. Um, another important thing about our recovery plan is um, 
we do identify the goal of delisting each ecosystem as it reaches recovery and then delisting the whole over 48 states after all six have reached recovery and then so it does imply that each ecosystem would have a recovery or conservation strategy specific to that ecosystem to serve as the post delisting monitoring plan so um, hopefully this map is familiar. These are the six recovery zones that are um, identified in our recovery plan. Um, currently, um, we only have bears in four of those ecosystems. We do not have a known population in the North, the North Cascades or the Bitterroot ecosystem, although as you've been hearing, we have more and more bears getting close to it. Um, for the Northern Continental Divide and the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem, you can see another broader boundary outside the recovery zone. Those two ecosystems um, in the process of developing conservation strategies have also developed a demographic monitoring area, which serves as a buffer around the recovery zone, or as we call it, post delisting um, the primary conservation area. And, um, We'll talk a little bit more about how those have been developed and the goals that are specific to each ecosystem as we go. Um, so one of the other purposes of this is the status assessment. Anytime the service wants to take an action on a species, it is required under the ESA that we do a, an assessment of the status. There's five factors involved. Most of the factors involve the threats to the species, such as habitat destruction modification or human-caused mortality, which were the two biggest threats for grizzly bears when they were listed. But the final factor is the adequacy of existing regulatory mechanisms. So in the absence of the act, what regulations will be in place to main sh make sure that that population will maintain recovery? And the conservation strategy summarizes those regulatory mechanisms that will be in place, and it's a commitment from all the partners that sit around these tables that the 